um, as stated in the notice and hearing has, will be conducted electronically and there is a Zoom link on the agenda for the public hearing. Um, for those of you listening at home, uh, we will be taking each petition warrant article up separately and we will have an opportunity to comment on each warrant article once we close the petition warrant. Did, you, did I say something else? No. Um, once we close the petition warrant article, we will then move on to the next one and close that. So we will not be taking comment on the previous ones. We're going to comment and close. Um, due to the circumstances relating to Zoom, we have a few protocols that need to be in place. First, prior to the beginning of the public hearing, I need all of the participants who are joining us by Zoom to ensure that their screen name is their first and last name. So please go in and change that now. Second, all participants will have their video and audio off. You, you will not be able to turn on your own video or audio unless granted that permission by the host. Um, and the host will be able to mute you. We will not be granted permission to have any video on and the video will not be allowed on. Um, participants wishing to be unmuted should raise their hand to be acknowledged by the board chair by using the Zoom raise hand feature. The host will alert the chair that your, your hand is raised. Um, once you're acknowledged, your audio will be turned on, but your video will remain disabled. And when you are done speaking, you will be muted. Um, for pub the public input portion of the each petition warrant article presentation, we are asking that input is restricted to policy Brooklyn residents of voting age, unless we make an exception for the administrator to ask a question. We need you to state your name and address. Um, you, your statements are being made to the board chair, um, and you need to keep your comments directed towards the petition warrant article that's on the floor, if you will. Um, petition Public input is not a question and answer opportunity. Um, we will note your input and we will consider it. Um, we, ask that we, are, we are asking that you keep your comments to two minutes, and we'll let you know when you have reached that point and we will mute you. So it, it is two minutes, I will say it's two minutes, and then we will mute you. Um, so you will be aware that the two minutes have expired. Um, there are some, um, and Tom Solon, vice chair, will be um, timing comments and he will give a 30 second warning. That's great. If you can manage that, uh, more power to you. Um, we have some requested, the, some of the petitioners have requested to present. They have been granted five minutes to present. They will have exactly five minutes. They will get a 30 second warning and they too will be muted. Um, all of those are the protocols that we've put in place to make this a, a meeting where everyone who wants to speak has an opportunity to speak and everyone gets an opportunity to be heard. Um, but we also have to respect everyone's time and it's a Zoom meeting. And so we want to make sure that they're also incredibly safe in the content that gets um, put on the screen. So all screen sharing is going to be done from us. Can I just, have I covered everything? Is there anything that I'm missing? Okay, do you think I've got it covered? Okay, so at this point, um, and I will be reading the petition order. I have one other thing that I want to say, I don't know, but these are citizens petition warrant articles. These are not board, the board is not, the board will take a position on these, but the board did not create these. So the words that I am reading are not coming from the board. They are coming from the citizens petition warrant articles. So at this point, I will open the floor for petition warrant article one, which states, Shall we adopt the provisions, provisions of RSA 32 5-B and implement a tax cap whereby the governing body or budget committee on parentheses shall not submit a recommended budget that increases the amount to be raised by local taxes based on the prior fiscal years and the actual amount of local taxes raised by more than 4%. Um, and at this point, I think, I believe Mr. Power of Brookline is um, going to be doing a presentation. Is he there? Um, as soon as he says not, as soon as he's there. Unfortunately, we have to wait for the cards. All right. 
Hello, this is Eric Power, 12 Westview Road, Brookline. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. I'm, I'm presenting this uh, tax cap article on behalf of Hollis and Brookline voters. Next slide. This is just for reference, this is the uh, petition warrant article. Note that it requires a 60% or three fifths majority to pass. Next slide. For reference is the, um, this is the uh, appropriate, the uh, corresponding RSA for the tax cap and how it works. Uh, next slide. So tax caps have been adopted by a number of towns and cities. Um, I have them listed here. So you can see that it's not a unique, uh, a unique uh, adoption of the RSA, including uh, the Brookline School District has a tax cap currently as well. Uh, next slide. So if you take a long-term view at the co-op from FY20, uh, 2005 to FY22 over 17 years, the co-op spending has been up over 79%. At the same time, the student population has been down 6%. So that equates to a student spending that's up 82% during those 17 years. And for comparison, the inflation from the CPIU is up just 37% or about 1.8% annually. So we have co-op spending that's increasing at more than double the rate of inflation, which is a lot. And that's what the tax cap is gonna help cure. Next slide. This is a graph showing the uh, per cost, the cost per student, which is basically the operating budget all, and all Warren articles divided by the number of students that particular year. And you can see we are down around $11,300 in 2005, and it's been growing rapidly. Um, especially in the past three years, we were at 18,200 roughly in uh, FY 18 and 19, and now we've jumped way up and we're gonna be uh, about 21,500 this year. So while inflation has been just about 37%, the cost per student has been up 82%. So we're more than doubling the rate of inflation in the co-op. Next slide. Co-op spending is, if you look at it, is really on an unsustainable trajectory. We've had a just decreasing population, but we've had rapidly increasing spending. And what's even um, a little more alarming this year is that we're seeing, we're going to see very large tax rate increases for the co-op. These are numbers from the uh, budget committee presented back on, uh, on February 2nd. And this uh, is gonna be a tax increase of 15.5% for Hollis and 15.9% for Brookline. And I would think that most taxpayers in the co-op would agree that these kinds of increases are not sustainable. And a tax cap would prevent this sort of increase from happening automatically. Next slide. Here's a composite plot showing the bar graph showing the student population and then the red line showing the uh, the operating budget, the, the budget we have for the co-op. And you can see in the last three years, inflation has been 4%. The students have been down 4%, but our budget is up over 13.3%. This is a problem. You can see in the NESDAQ projections that the population is not expected to go up in the next five years for the whole co-op. So the budget should be not be going up at this alarming rate. We have the third year of our San Bernice teachers contract that's hitting us this year. And then we also have, um, well, next year it'll be, this, it'll be a San Bernice increase. And we also have the turf field that we're paying for. Next slide. I would like, be, like taxpayers to consider, last year we had a 2% tax cap proposed it got about uh, almost 40% approval. It needs 60%. So this year, the citizens have decided to go for a 4% tax cap, which is way above any inflation we've seen in, in recent memory. 4% seems to be a very reasonable guardrail for spending. It provides a reasonable and sustainable spending uh, profile for the Hollis Brookline Co-op. So I would encourage all voters to support this tax cap for reasonable and sustainable spending for the Hollis Brookline Co-op. Thank you very much. I'm done. Thank you. Uh, 
at this point, that are, is there anyone else raising their hand to comment? Do we have anyone else? I'm going to turn it off to Zoom because I want to make sure you can scroll through and see. I know there's no one out there. Scrolling up and down. Oh, there's one hand up. You see it, Bob? Oh, Cindy Ryher. Okay. Can I talk? Yes, you may speak, Cindy. Hi, this is Cindy Ryher. I may have missed, I, I did miss because I couldn't find the passcode the very beginning. Um, I'm just curious when we'll act. I'm assuming this is just being presented tonight and we'll vote on this at the annual meeting, or when will these be voted on? It, the intention is to this to be voted on in our annual meeting, which is at, we are hoping to be an in-person meeting that we are working on the schedule for tonight. We'll be deciding the date either April 10th or the 17th, or possibly an alternate date. But we'll be All right, thank you. In-person meeting. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Cindy. That was Cindy Ryder. Oh. Is there anyone else? No? Okay. Seeing no further comment on um, Petition Warrant Article, we call this Article 1, but it's actually Petition Warrant Article 2, because we've already had a Petition Warrant Article, right? Yeah, so all the new numbers. Oh, okay. so the, um, the one for tonight. Okay. So David Sachs has his hand up. Who has his hand up? David Sachs. David Sachs? Okay, that's fine. Um, David. Hi. Can you hear me okay? David, you are on. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you for hosting us. I have a question on that warrant article. What's the uh, what's the margin that it has to pass by? It has to get 60%. I'm sorry, this is David Sachs. David, your address? 43 Jambard Road in Hollis. And your question is, what is the margin that we, the, the vote needs to pass by? 60%. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. No? No, nope, thank you. Thanks, David. Um, we have Aaron. Um, thank you. Um, Aaron, can you unmute Aaron? Okay, I don't know if I said your last name right, Aaron. That's okay. That's okay. I'm used to it. So, uh, Aaron, Aaron Pencasek, I'm at 133 Dow Road in Hollis. And I'm, I'm retired. And my wife and I moved here about five years ago. And I'm, I'm appalled at the increases in the taxes and revenue being spent by the school system that we heard about in the earlier presentation. I don't have any kids in school right now, but I don't mind paying my fair share, which in Hollis is 70% of my property taxes to support the public school system. But, but these kinds of increases, uh, just demonstrate that there is poor fiscal management in our co-op school system. People need to pay attention to this and something needs to be done about it or you're gonna be driving people like me and my wife out of Hollis because I don't wanna pay for this, right? Something needs to be done. I'm gonna upset taxpayer looking at those statistics that we saw earlier and I'm done. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Okay, we have Jim O'Shaughnessy. Jim O'Shaughnessy. Okay. Jim, as, of, as our attorney. Oh, <clears throat> All right, so can you hear me? Yes. Hi, everybody. Jim O'Shaughnessy. I'm uh, legal counsel for the school district, and I'm weighing in only to clarify that under RSA 32.5, um, the... I believe the vote uh, is requires a three fifths majority vote rather than a majority vote. And I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, we also have uh, Michelle St. John. Michelle, Michelle St. John. Okay, so can we unmute Michelle? Okay, Michelle, you are unmuted. Um, I'll just be very brief. I'm just not in support of the tax cap uh, based on um, 
impending legislation up in Concord that could um, drastically impact the um, state contribution to school budgets. Um, having a tax cap would be a huge detriment to the students, to the administration, to the school board in their ability in creating a budget that would sustain our district. Um, the other comment I would just like to make is if you look at what the cost per pupil at the high school level or the middle school within the co-op, it is comparable to many districts across the state. And so I would just say that this problem is connected to how we fund public education in New Hampshire versus this particular problem. And it will not be solved in a positive way by implementing a tax cap. Thank you. Thank you. And Michelle, can you just state your name and address, please? Yep, it's Michelle St. John, 29 Orchard Drive, Hollis. Thank you. Um, so I, I see Brian Loveland. Okay, I have a, I'll take Brian Loveland first, and then if the public would like to speak in public, just come to the mic and I'll acknowledge you once we figure that out. So who are we? Yeah, I know, I got it. Yeah, it's a few times. Brian Loveland, please state your name and address. Brian? Is Brian Loveland on? Hi, uh, 17 Hobby Book Road. And uh, I just want to come and say I'm against this arbitrary uh, tax cap that won't allow any wiggle room in case unexpected expenses. And with the state funding uncertain, we won't have the flexibility to continue having such a great school. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Doug Davidson. Yeah, Doug Davis, A5 Ryan Road. I'm speaking uh, for myself, but I am the former ranking member of the Cooperative Budget Committee. And I want to say that the rates that we're looking at are really unsustainable from a long term standpoint. We need to take a look at that. I think Aaron Kranchek's comments were, were spot on. You know, we're throwing a lot of our seniors and others under the bus because they can't afford these rates of increases. And, uh, you know, some of the the Douglas Award you heard before about the way we fund our schools, the tradition here in Hollis and in the state of Texas to fund our schools locally with nominal amounts coming from the state relative to the overall budget. And that's a dog whistle for our state income tax, so let's, let's call it what it is. The other thing I think we need to pay particular attention to, which kind of always goes under the radar, is the incredible growth of the staff and the budget to the SAE one. As a former high school teacher, I can tell you that that's where the rubber meets the road. I think intellectually, anybody understands that. The question is where the rubber meets the road. And we've done a good job of keeping the student teacher ratio in check in terms of allowing optimal situations in the classroom. But the SAU office, all due respect to the staff there, who I call there fairly regularly, and I think they do a fine job. I think that that budget is growing too fast. It has been since my experience being on the budget committee. And it remains so for this day. So I think the cap is in order. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Cindy Reinhardt has her hand up again. Cindy Reinhardt, is there anyone else before we let Cindy speak again? No, I gave everyone else a chance. Everyone else is gone. Yep. Okay, Cindy, we're going to bring you back on. Please state your name and address. Cindy? Cindy? I think we need to mute Cindy then. I don't, I'm not hearing you from her. No? Cindy, are you there? Okay. Let's try one more time. Okay. I just... Cindy, are you there? I don't think she's there. Okay. Maybe she accidentally raised her hand. Uh, so sure. we have Patrick Haggerty now. Patrick Haggerty? Okay, can you unmute him? Mm -hmm. Hi, Patrick Haggerty, 25 Parker Road in Brookline. Um, so I have a young child who has not yet entered the school district. And I, I, I don't see a problem with implementing a 4% cap on spending. Uh, it's not like we're cutting budgets. We're just saying you can't raise the budget more than that. Obviously, you know, as an educator or as people that are in charge of the education of children, you want to give the kids as best 
uh, chance as possible. And we have great reputation as a school district. However, um, you know, how long am I going to wait for my two-year-old to, to enter the schools and how much am I going to pay? And are the schools going to continue to be worth that money as the student population continues to decline, if it continues to decline as predicted? Um, so I, I'm in support and uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cindy has her hand up again. Okay. Can you hear me this time? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry about the technical difficulties. Cindy Ryherd, 150 Witches Spring Road, Hollis. I just wanted to find out when the school board will be, um, I guess, responding or providing your response to this uh, this proposal. So tonight we will take a vote on, on each one of the petition warrant articles, all the warrant articles, so we will vote on this. Whether or not we comment will be decided when we take a vote. So we'll have okay. an opportunity. But we do not have a planned presentation. Okay. okay. Thank you. So are there any other comments? I see none. Okay. Seeing no other hands raised or people in the audience, I will now close the public hearing on Petition Warrant Article 1 at 6.50 p.m. And I will now open, well, I will read, I'll read the Petition Warrant Article 2 and then open the floor for public comment. So, shall we adopt the provisions of RSA 40? Colon 13, known as SB2, to allow official ballot voting on all issues for the Hollis Brookline Cooperative School District on the second Tuesday of March. At this point, um, I'd like to open the floor, and I believe we have a presentation from Mr. Power on this topic as well. It is 651 of opening the floor, John. You should start one. We need to bring up Eric Power, who has a presentation, and we will be. Sorry, well. give me one second. Eric, are you on? Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you. Sorry. Once we're once we've got that. Okay, you can go ahead, Eric. Thank you. This I'm speaking on behalf of the citizens of Hollis and Brookline that have put forth this petition to adopt the SB2 official mm -hmm. balloting voting for the for the Hollis Brookline co-op. Next slide. What is SB2? SB2 is really a way to conduct our school district meetings in two sessions. It consists of a deliberative session and a ballot voting session. So the deliberative session is same is the same format as our current meeting. It's open to all voters with debate, discussion, amendments, and motions. What the purpose of the deliberative session is to finalize the warrant articles for the second session, the ballot voting session. The main difference is, is that the final vote is a, an approval or disapproval of warrant articles uh, is done in the second session. So here you finalize the warrant articles in the deliberative session, then you go to the ballot voting section, session, which is held on town election day, um, it's second Tuesday in March. So there's a private ballot vote on each warrant article that you finalize in the deliberative session. It's held at the same time as you have the town and school district elections and zoning questions. And the voting can be done anytime. The polls are open 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Or you can vote by absentee ballot, which is a great advantage now, especially with COVID. Next slide. So the operating budget is the big is one of the big things you have to consider. The operating budget will always exist. It'll either be the operating, you'll have a choice on the SB2 ballot to vote for a proposed operating budget from the deliberative session or a default operating budget that's specified in the RSA, which is really, um, it's reduced by one-time expenditures from the previous year. And the proposed operating budget, depending on the deliberative session, can be higher or lower than the default operating budget, but there'll be two, uh, two numbers in that question for the operating budget. Next slide. The advantages of SB2 is it increases voter participation. In Brookline, we had over a almost a thousand people that, that voted in the Brookline School District because we have SB2 for our school district. And there's two opportunities to participate. You can participate in the deliberative session or and or the ballot voting session. You also get more at least 30 days after the deliberative session to consider what you're going to be voting on. You don't have to be thinking about it in the, in the split moment like you would at a school district meeting. And you actually can do fact checking on things that have been said. 
You also have the privacy of, of ballot voting. You can vote your, your conscience and you're doing it in the privacy of your, uh, of your ballot box. You also have the flexibility to vote anytime on election day or by absentee ballot, which is very uh, important for business travel, college students, military members, snowbirds, and now with COVID. And those unable to attend the current town meeting and current school meeting still get to vote. You don't have to remain at a town meeting that goes to midnight or later. Next slide. The disadvantages of, of SB2 is that um, you have to communicate well after, before and after the deliberative session to the, to the public to, on what you want to do and, and what the positions are in the warrant articles. You cannot also table warrant articles. Warrant articles will be voted upon. They're always placed on the ballot. They may be modified, but they're always gonna be voted upon. Another disadvantage is that you can't do reconsideration and, and bring back articles multiple times it's, it's either passed or it's defeated. It cannot be brought up later in a meeting. There is an exception for an operating budget if it's failed, but that's, um, that's been resolved by having the default budget. Next slide. This is just for reference that we've had meetings that have been one session, two session, three sessions, and even five sessions. It's difficult for voters to commit to go to these meetings versus doing a deliberative session and then a, a, a ballot session where they just go in and vote on election day. Uh, last year, we actually had two meeting, two sessions, one for apportionment only, and then we had drive-through voting in June. So in 2018, we had 14 hours of meetings. Next slide. This shows the, um, keep going, keep going. Next slide, go down. This shows the attendance at SB2 in Brookline. We've had quite a few people voting, almost a thousand um, that, that participate in it. And the deliberative session is about the same as our traditional meeting was when we started it. Next slide. So I would ask that, that voters, oh, next, before that, go back. I would ask that voters, uh, it's moving around. Next, go down. There's more opportunities to, to participate with the two sessions. It provides a longer and more informed discussion on all warrant articles and ensues, ensures privacy and ability to vote for all voters. Eric, your five minutes are up. Thank you. Okay, at this point, um, I'd like to open the floor for public comments. I see Barbara King. Barbara King. Please state your name and address. Yeah. Barbara. Hello, Barbara King, 15 Barton Road in Hollis. And I'm actually not terribly opposed to SB2, but I am opposed to the fact we just are, these 28 citizens that signed this petition aren't listening to the will of the voters from last year that voted down SB2. It continues to get voted down. And in a crazy year with the pandemic, we're throwing it back on the warrant. And one of the biggest arguments against SB2 is that the deliberative session can be taken over. Well, our current meeting is being taken over by 28 people that have put four petition warrant articles on because the bar to get a petition article is 25 people. So they're actually convincing me that they would go and take over a deliberative session to get what they want. Um, and I just wish they would really listen to the will of the voters and maybe not every year, but how about every other year we put this off? Thank you. Barbara. I see Kat McGee. Kat McGee. Okay, Kat, please state your name and address for the record. Yes, Kat McGee, 237 Hayden Road in Hollis. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was just gonna say, uh, similar to the last person who spoke, um, we do hear this over and over again. And I just wanted to say, although the presentation from Mr. Powers was quite informative, I think there are some things that he left out that are really critical in terms of context of, what we would gain or lose because democracy is hard. It's true, our town meetings are long, but it is the, the town meeting is the purest form of democracy. And it's really uh, been a wonderful thing for me over the years, being able to attend and understand people in our community explaining the context around what we're voting for and why. And um, I have had the pleasure of serving in a floatarial district with four towns, two of which had SB2 and two of which did not. And I attended SB2 meetings in the other towns. And I can say that the complaints that 
uh, those towns have put forth after implementing SB2. And this has been reiterated by former state rep Jim Belander in town many times in uh, articles he's written against SB2, is that uh, the deliberative session does not afford the same level of debate. So the warrant articles are merely presented. They are not debated. They are not discussed uh, at the level that they are at town meeting. And so that level of understanding is not there. And also, um, one thing that was kind of glossed over, which has been very significant for many of the smaller towns, is that if a group of people shows up at a deliberative session and decides they want to change a budget level item and remove $800,000, they, if they are able to pass that at the deliberative session, that's what goes on the ballot. And there's no discussion about it. There's no way to change it. There's no way to table it. And so, um, yeah. you know... Thank you. Your 30 seconds, your minutes are over. Thank you, Pat. Okay, I see um, Patrick Haggerty. Patrick Haggerty, please state your name and address. Hi, Patrick Haggerty, 25 Parker Road, Brookline. Um, so I, I think I understand where Kat's coming from. I think she also contradicted herself a little bit. When you talk about pure democracy, showing up at the meetings is an important part of that. So if the deliberative session is something that you find important, which when we're talking about school district issues, you know, you should probably show up. And I understand that there's schedules and there's uh, people have lives. But at the same time, this battle of attrition that has happened at the last few um, co-op meetings where it's gone late into the night and they basically wait until enough people have left and they vote on, you know, whatever it is they wanted to vote on and pass it. I think this gives us that time, that breathing room between forming the ideas that we want to vote on and then voting on them later. It gives people a chance to talk about them. And if you don't like it, if you don't like it, then don't vote for it. That's that's a great part. And you can tell other people about it for more than a month that you don't like it. And here's why you don't like it. So there's plenty of opportunity for discussion there between the deliberative session and the actual voting session. Um, and then finally, uh, regarding the will of the people, the percentage of voters that voted for or against SB2 was uh, barely considered a majority, uh, I think, of both Hollis and Brookline. There was not a high participation rate, and the majority that ruled there was is who ruled. But um, the will of the people, I don't think, represents the entire picture from last year when the vote took place. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I have Michelle St. John. Michelle St. John, please state your name and address for the record. Michelle St. John, uh, 29 Orchard Drive in Hollis, and I'm against this petition warrant, warrant article for multiple reasons, which many of have been stated previously. I will echo um, some of what Barb King said, what um, Representative uh, Kat McGee has said, and um, the Honorable Jim Belanger, who spoke passionately year after year after year against SB2 who, um, by the way, has served on the municipal and county um, committee, government committee for the state house for many, many years and is well-versed in this area. Towns um, that adopt SB2 see a decrease in participation in deliberative sessions, allowing small yet very vocal groups attend and commandeer a meeting warn article and propose and vote on changes that are detrimental to the district, our students and the overall budget. Eric Powers presentation, he really glossed over this one where he showed, um, he said his attendance in these deliberative sessions are consistent. I saw numbers of 60, 40, 100, 69 people making those decisions. It's easy for a small, dedicated minority to come and commandeer a meeting. And they can change that budget because even though everyone's so excited to have all day voting, that all day voting, you don't get an opportunity for debate. You don't get an opportunity to ask questions. All you get is that decide, decided decision to vote on. And if a small group comes in, which isn't the majority of these two districts, what they want for their students in this community, that impacts their property values, you don't have a choice. SB2 is really easy to vote in. SB2 is really difficult to vote out. 
Also, I've served on the Hollis School Board and participated in budgeting process for both the school, Hollis School Board and the SAU governing. Okay, we have Maureen Matheson. I'm sorry, I was Maureen. Maureen Matheson. Hi, my name is Maureen Matheson, uh, 60 Milton Place in Hollis. I just want to express my um, opposition to SB2 uh, for the reasons stated previously. Um, I won't go into those again. Um, and also but to, to state the fact that voting this down year after year has become tiresome. I do plead with Mr. Power and the powers and, and the others to please stop putting this to a, a legislative body. Listen to the will of the people, let it go. If we don't want it, knock it off. Thank you. Okay, we well, have David Sachs. David Sachs, please state your name and address for the record. Hello, I'm David Sachs, 43 Jam Mod Road, Hollis, New Hampshire. I'm a strong supporter of schools and education funding. I'm also a strong supporter of SB2. I lived in a town, Bedford, that has SB2. And, but for one year, every year, it was very possible to have thorough debate on every warrant. And you, you went, you wrote it on each item on the warrant it looked like. You agreed on the language. 30 days later, you had a chance to then vote uh, on the actual warrant itself. The benefit of SB2, the biggest one for me is absentee ballot. Uh, you, you are able to participate where not everyone is able to show up. The second thing is families with young children often mm -hmm. can't stay and participate in every vote. This way they get to voice on every one. It's also people that can't stay late, regardless of young children, jobs, flying, travel, whatever it might be, work. I just find that this is a way where we can have greater participation and greater participation equals greater democracy. Well, I mentioned one year in Bedford where it did go awry, where a small group of people took over uh, and did get some massive changes. And the purpose of our job is to be uh, to be um, committed and participating voters and to show up. If we don't show up, even in the current format, things can get taken over. So again, I support SV2 and I wish we'd finally do it. Thank you. David. We have Mike Kalina. Mike, can you please state your name and address for the record? Hi, my name is Mike Kalina, 7 Mary's Way in Hollis. Um, I would like to voice my support for SB2. Um, I am, myself and my wife are uh, two of those people that were spoken about uh, where we are unable to uh, attend meetings that run until all hours in the morning and wait for votes. Um, we've had three children go through the, the school system. One is currently still in. Um, we're very interested and very invested in the quality of our school system. But that said, in our, in our time in this town with our children in the schools, we've attended these meetings a few times and have never been able to stay until voting time. As the previous uh, speaker said, um, we have babysitters watching kids that can't stay till two in the morning. We have jobs that require us to be on phone calls at five or six in the morning. We can't be at meetings where people just debate the minutia of, de of these uh, warrants for hours and hours. Um, I think it's very valuable to have the session where people can uh, voice and discuss but as, uh, as it was stated, it would also be valuable to then have a month to research facts and details and then make informed decisions rather than decisions that are made after exhaustion of hours of mindless debate. Um, thank you, that's all. Okay, we have Aaron Pinkasek. Aaron, can you please state your name and address for the record? Yes, so it's Aaron Pinkasek. I'm at 133 Dow Road in Hollis. And I am speaking in support of SB2. Every one of the citizens in this town that pays taxes should have the opportunity to voice their opinion on the bill and legislation that comes up regarding the school system. Right? And so I'm not going to repeat what you've already heard about these meetings running ad, ad nauseum into the night, uh, but I can't stay that late, right? But but I, I pay taxes. I pay a lot of taxes in here in, in Hollis for the school system. I expect to be able to voice my opinion 
and place my votes on these items without having to stay until 2 a.m. And that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Is that it? Okay, we have one person in public. In person. <coughs> Please state your name and address. Judge Aruba, Nancy Council. Judge Aruba, 28 Winchester Drive. Um, I don't know if anyone else had trouble, but I was on the Zoom call and I, I couldn't raise my hand. So I don't know if that's an issue for other people. That's why I do that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so um, I'm speaking against the, the petition article for SB2. Uh, the benefit of our traditional town meeting is that all voters get to see and hear from both sides of an issue. In my opinion, town politics has largely been free from the partisan rancor that national politics suffers from. Seeing and hearing directly from your neighbors and learning their viewpoints helps us understand each other and work together towards the best solutions. The SB2 system allows voters to be influenced by advertising campaigns and partisan. People often seek out information that supports or reinforces their own biases. Look at the national news channels like Fox or CNN. Without the complete picture from the traditional town meeting, our local politics will suffer from the same divergence of opinions and fractured nature as it has on the national level. Please vote no on this article and preserve the great system that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Mask up, mask up. Please put the mask on. Thank you. Sorry. Anybody else? Okay. Um, I don't know what to do about that. Yeah. Uh, do you have any other evidence you can like? I sent a message to all the participants in chat saying that if there is an issue with hand raising, we can use the chat function okay, to be able to um, indicate their desire to speak, and I'll let you know. Okay. So if you did hear that, just in case you didn't hear Bob. Um, if you'd like to comment, please send him a chat message. And I'm going to give it like a minute. We have Lene Day. Did she raise her hand? Raise her hand. Did she raise her hand? Yep. Okay. Lene? Yeah, hi. Lene, Lene Day, 140. Oh, sorry. Uh, Lene Day, 145 Broad Street. Um, my only comment is that the chat feature is disabled. And so we can't actually send, and maybe it's just for me, but I just tried to send a chat and it was disabled. So, um, okay. yeah. Well, uh, there are enough hands being raised. I, Do you have hands raised now? I mean, not at the moment, but we've had quite a few. I I don't mind. It doesn't matter. I mean, I have that word. You could also take it by email. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just, here's my, if you're listening, here's my cell phone 759 9175. Good luck. Text me now if you want to participate. I don't care. That's so, that whole boy the No, but you're all going to text me. I don't care. I don't care. I did get a message with the chat function that says what. Okay, so the chat function is working. I am not. I'll give you one more, like 10 more seconds, and then if I don't receive a text from anybody, then I am. And I'm not going to repeat that number. So you have to already posted it on Facebook. Okay, that's good. I don't care. It's really, it's a phone. It's not going to be Okay. Anything? Anyone? All right. At this point, I'm going to close. Rob, Mary. Oh, Rob. Okay. Rob Van, please state your name and address for the record. I feel like I know everyone who's at this hotel today. That's great. It's a nice small town. Hey, folks, can you hear me? Yes, we can. State your name and address. Rob Mann, 29 Nartoff Road, and I want to speak in opposition to this um, perennial uh, warrant article. It comes up every year. We go through this debate every year. We hear the same uh, 
you know, reasons for having it and the benefits and the pros and the cons and everything else. All it does is take up time in our regular meetings. And for folks that are that put forward about the deliberative session and all the great things in a deliberative session, I would ask each and every one of you to consider that we already have that. It's called public hearings that we have just held this week with very little participation. And I would also ask you to also consider that we also have a deliberative session for the SAU um, budget that we have in early December. I've been serving on this board since 2007. I can count the people who have showed up to that deliberative session on one hand over that entire time. Um, I would be very concerned, I continue to be concerned about the very small turnout of a SB2 deliberative session and the shenanigans that can take place under that, those kind of uh, situations. I have been, I am now, and will continue to be against SB2. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mann. Any more? I have not gotten any text. Oh, hold on. Oh. I've had 15. What is it? iPad number 15. Hi, this is Lee Kubishta, 94 Hayden Road in Hollis. I am for SB2, and I think that the people who have spoken against SB2 actually have made my point for me um, and reaffirmed my commitment to SB2. Um, the, they discuss lack of participation and lack of involvement. And I think that that very point speaks to the fact that people would be more participative if they could vote and not have to stay up until whatever time. I've been to some of these meetings as well. And <clears throat> it is, um, an arduous process. I think the deliberative session and having the 30 days between allows people and trusts that people will self-educate themselves and vote accordingly. I think that the, the back and forth and um, people arguing back and forth for hours on end is what turns people off to participating. I know I would much prefer to have the facts from both sides in evidence and be able to make an informed decision on my own and then vote. And I think the SB2 allows that possibility. And I am a strong proponent of SB2. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Lee. Else? Michelle, thank you again. Is there anybody who hasn't spoken? Oh, all of a sudden. Hold on. Just as fancy. Just as St. John. Okay, Michelle. Uh, thank you. Thank you for letting me speak again. I just wanted to finish what I was going to say when I was cut off. And by serving on the um, school board and participating in the budget process uh, for both the Hollis School Board and the SAU Governing Board. I wanted to say that budgets don't happen in a vacuum. Um, budget season begins practically after um, the annual district meeting. And it takes months and goes through iteration after iteration after iteration. And much time is devoted during those uh, monthly school meetings to go through the budget to ensure that um, there isn't overspending. I've, saw, I've seen wonderful things start off on the budget and you think this is gonna be great for the students and they get cut. And they get cut because of the guidance that our budget committees, the co-op committees, the Hollis School Committee, the Brookline Budget Committee, those are the ones who are providing that guidance to us. It is a process. And to just say that um, that is not valuable and someone can come in 
and say, we're going to change this and take all of that months of consideration and hard work out of the process is, is just, it just seems ludicrous to me. We, these are the experts. These folks spend time on this. And the other point I wanted to make was, you know, we're sometimes there till 2 a.m. because of warrant or petition articles such as these. We're sometimes there till 2 a.m. because there are hot button topics that people want to debate. You know, how do you decide on what it is if you don't have the full information? You know, can you depend on, on do you, we come to those meetings for the facts, not for falsities, not for opinion, but the facts. And so again, I'm going to say that SB2 is not the solution. If people don't want to come to those meetings and they want to just vote on something, perhaps we should be looking at a representative meeting rather than individuals. I mean, this is just not the solution for Hollis. People like information, they like to ask questions. Another two minutes is up, thank you. We have Aaron from Kasich again. Okay, Mr. Aaron. So, I'm, so I'm back, Aaron from Kasich, 133 Dow Road in Hollis. And um, yeah, I, I, I agree with a lot of what she just said there. It's, it's a process that we have to go through, uh, but it doesn't have to be an arduous process. It has to be a process where all the citizens have a reasonable opportunity to represent their views on these topics. Right? And uh, uh, to the earlier presentation we saw on the previous uh, warrant article, um, you know, the, the expenditures uh, that we're seeing projected in the school system are, are just un unreasonable. And, and you know, we, we, need, we need to be reasonable about it and everybody needs to have their ability to present their view relative to the school system budgets and other topics for that matter in the town. And SB2 would enable that. There's no reason, I mean, so look at what happened in our recent election, the presidential election, right? We had all the mail-in ballots and everything that happened, right? That's no different than SV2. Right? So people are okay with that. Why are we, on, why are we not okay with SV2? I'm done. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else? Okay, we have Mr. Kasich again. Mallory Rizler. You have somebody else? Mallory Rizler, yep. Mallory, can you state your name and record and address for the record? Hi, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Hi, <laughs> um, Mallory Rizler, 14 Hobart Hill Road in Brookline. Okay. Um, I just wanted to share my experience um, as someone who has lived in town for a few years and was a supporter of SB2 before I started attending the deliberative sessions between both Brookline and the co-op school board. Um, I'm a mother of three small children. I get the, we can't stay late, we can't, it's exhausting, so I can see those points. Um, but I think we just have to look at what we sacrifice for one or a couple nights a year. Um, to what we're gaining, um, you know, when we're sitting that pickup line, picking up our kids from school, when we see their faces get off the school bus, when we're so enjoying um, what a great asset we have in our two towns. Um, I think we need to think about what we're giving as citizens. Um, so that would be my first point. And the second point I would have to say is I would have, it's the petition articles that I would have to would what previous um, speakers have said are what are causing the most issues I can say for myself as um, somebody who does not support SB2 because as people have said previously I won't keep going over it it continues to be the same small group of people um, who continue to bring these things to light so I would say that the trust necessarily is not there for me that things are being done in the best way and in the best interest of our kids and our two towns. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Y'all good? I think so. 
Okay, at this point, I'm going to close public comment to Petition Warrant Article 2 at 724. I will open the floor for Petition Article 3, which is to see if the Hollis Brookline Cooperative School District will to see if Hollis Brookline Cooperative School District will vote to amend the Articles of Agreement of the Hollis Brookline Cooperative School District by deleting Article 3 as currently written and substituting new article as follows. Article the suggested Article 3 would be the Hollis Brookline Cooperative School District shall be responsible for grades 9 through 12. I'm going to open the floor for public comment at 7.24 p.m. We will start with a presentation by Mr. Power. You have five minutes, Eric. Yes, this is uh, Eric Power. Um, I'm presenting this on behalf of Hollis and Brookline voters about uh, realignment of the Hollis Brookline Cooperative School District. Next slide. This is the uh, Warren article that Chair Darrelou just read to you. Uh, basically changing Article 3 of the Articles of Agreement. For those who aren't familiar, the Articles of Agreement is basically the constitution of the co-op and it specifies how we do things at a high level. And this is the one that talks about the grades. Next, next slide. So this picture here is showing the current organization of the SAU where we have a K through six Hollis School District, a K through six Brookline School District, and then we have a co-op at the bottom which has grades seven and eight at Hollis Brookline Middle School and grades uh, nine through 12 at Hollis Brookline High School. If you go to the next slide, it will show the proposed uh, change with this article of, of agreement change would make Hollis uh, School District K through eight and Brookline K through eight. And then the co-op would be nine through 12 at Hollis Brookline High School. Next slide. So why, why consider realignment? Why do the citizens think this is a good idea? Well, the current middle school facility, as you'll see, is, is old, and I'll go through some details on that. We also see the student population growth coming up in the elementary schools by the NESJEC projections. That's the organization that the SAU uses every year to figure out where, how many students we're going to have in the future with the predictive model. There's also financial conditions of historically low bond rates and revived building aid proposed by our legislature. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about the articles of agreement process that we have. Next slide. So the next, keep going, next slide. The current middle school building was actually built in 1953. It's 68 years ago. It had an addition in 1961 and 1982, a renovation in 93, a maintenance upgrade in 2003, and then a, a major renovation and addition in 2005. There's been three major additions on this 60 year old building and if you look at it, further expansion is not really practical and it would be very expensive. Next slide. So why, what's going on with student population growth? So here's, here's what we're seeing in our seventh and eighth grade now. Um, and you actually see starting in the year 2022, it's about equal between Hollis and Brookline. And then Brookline will actually have more students in seventh and eighth grade than Hollis, according to the NESDEC. And um, you can also see that we're gonna start uh, getting to, towards the high end of what the school can actually handle in uh, the year 2028 and 2029. The point I'd like to make is it took us about five years to expand this middle school for those who were in town. So it's a process you need to start because it takes a long time for things to pass, to investigate, and then actually do the construction. Next slide. So if you look at what's happening in Hollis, which is the blue here, Hollis is actually going to grow rapidly in K through six, 41% by the year 2028. They're going to be up to 843 students per NESDEC. They're not going to have enough room in their Hollis primary hues to ho hold everybody. So this, this uh, realignment would actually help Hollis because they would have a they could use Hollis Brookline Middle School. Next slide. So the possible usage could be Hughes being 3-4. HMS would be Hollis Middle School, 5 through 8. In Brookline would build a brand new uh, Brookline Middle School or expand CSDA. And then we would still have the co-op uh, in, in the high school for grades nine through 12. Next slide. Financial conditions, bond rates are at historic lows. They're very favorable for renovation, new construction. And uh, there's, there's, two, there's two house bills, you can look them up, 214 and 594 that are gonna revive school building aid. Next slide. Here's the articles of agreement. 
There's Article 15 in the Articles of Agreement calls out how we would do this process if there's a vote. So this is this article is the initial vote by the legislative body. They would form a grade reduction committee. The committee would develop an educational plan, a public, they would hold a public hearing of the proposed plan. It would be sent to the State Board of Education. And then there would be a final vote on that by the legislative body. So there's actually two, two votes by the legislative body to determine this is the right way to go. Next slide. Thank you. Um, support realignment of the Hollis Brookline Cooperative School District. It's a proactive approach for our children. We don't want the middle school to get overcrowded like it did last time and not have any options. And lastly, I'd just like to say I cannot do chat and I cannot do any uh, hand raising in my Zoom. So I, I'd like to speak on the next article if I can't get through. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Eric. Okay, so people are still having a hard time getting through. They could email any of the SAU administrators that are currently here, right? You, you, you would see an email. That would be um, Andy Corey at SAU 41. Is it Andy or Andy? Either one. Oh, Andrew. Andy.Corey at SAU 41.org. Um, Bob Thompson, Bob.Thompson at SAU 41.org. Or Gina Berksoff. The -E -R -G -F -K -A -G -F -K -A <laughs> Gina dot that last name oh, at wow. SAU. <laughs> so Andy or Bob will probably be your best. <laughs> so we are, problem. you know, they can email any of us. You know, we, we are all watching our phones. So if there's somebody out there who cannot get through, you can email the SAU team. Um, one of the three that are sitting here, and you can email me on the SAU41.org. Colleague Babcock, um, and I will see it. I'll watch it. And you can also text me. I gave my number out early, sir, and I'm not seeing any text right now. Um, I see Barbara King. So, Barbara King to open comment on um, petition. Actually, I just have a question for the attorney, Jim, before we open public comment. Is Jim there? Yeah, Jim's here. Can you hear me? Jim, can you hear me? Can you unmute Jim? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear, Holly. Jim, I just want to know if you, and I'm putting you on the spot, I didn't ask you to look this up or anything, but legally, do you know if um, if this were to pass and the article changed 9 through 12, like this pass, or we have a new Article 3, 9 through 12, would that be effective July 1st, 2020? Oh, no, the the um Article 15 of the Articles of Agreement has a pretty comprehensive process for forming a, um, a, a, a study committee and the study committee has to propose a plan the plan I have I, I don't know the details of the process intimately but there's okay. a plan it has to be approved at various levels and the plan itself um, establishes the timetable for the transition and so it's not it's not dictated at this level it's definitely not going to happen by July 1st 2021 uh, that that's not even possible. Um, I don't know if it would be possible for it to happen by July one of two thousand twenty-two. But the but the committee develops the timetable if that helps at all. Triggers the committee then if this were to pass. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Is there do you have a question for me? No. Okay. Maybe during. Okay, and Tom's going to answer my question for me. That's helpful. The wording in the article is three that you referenced. Uh, the same wording that you used in the RSA for the dissolution of the co op. So it's essentially a two year process. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. So now we have um, Barbara King commenting. And um, Barbara, just state your name and address again. Hello, uh, Barbara King, 15 Barton Road in Hollis. Um, I just want to start with, you know, Mr. Power has certainly changed his tune from his conversations in Brookline last week, where this was based on how this would save Brookline taxpayers um, money. And this is not realignment. This is, again, breaking up the co-op, which Brookline voted down last year to say Brookline voted to stay in the co-op. A few years ago, Hollis voted for a study and then decided it was too expensive. So, you know, we've been through all this. So I just asked the voters dig into this and don't fall for realignment. He's particularly targeted special education costs. And the numbers he was showing seem to be void of 
some particular things of interest, I think, to all voters, which is return on investment and economies of scale. And those are two sound financial principles with even putting forth an article like this, the petitioners should be thinking about. If you think about, if you have Brookline put forth a middle school or a middle school and high school, you're talking about tens of millions of dollars that first you have to pay before, as Mr. Power stated last week, you start to save money. This return on investment is, I would say, 15 to 18 years away at a minimum from now. So don't fall that this is to assess. This is just to assess. This is about breaking up the co-op, and the voters have spoken several times over the last year. And this will decimate our property values in Hollis and Brookline, where the underpinning is our great schools. And that's all I have to say tonight. Thank you, Steve. Next. We have, we have Kat McGee. Kat McGee, please state your name and address for the record. Kat McGee, 237 Hayden Road. Um, I, I am opposed to this um, warrant article and I just wanted to say something briefly about the presentations and the comments about the unsustainability of the taxes based on the schools um, it's true that a significant portion of our taxes go to the schools, that's, that's the way it works. But when I look at my uh, tax rate in Hollis uh, for, for 2015 was $23 um, and change. And in 2016, it was $23 and change. And in 2017, it was $23 and change. 2167 in 2018 and 2310 for 2019. So our taxes have been held very steady in terms of the amount per thousand. We are not seeing exorbitant increases in our tax impact based on the cost of the schools. And I think that that goes back to the point that was made by Michelle St. John that uh, the people who are volunteers that do our budgets actually do a really good job of holding us steady and doing right by the taxpayers. So I think that it's a false argument that we hear again and again and again that we should be alarmed when actually, um, you know, our tax rate's been very, very steady over this time. So that's it. Thank you. We have David Sack. David, you're on. Please state your name and address again, sorry. No problem. This is David Sachs, 43 Jambard Road in Hollis. Uh, I am flabbergasted by this article, to be quite candid. I think it's ridiculous. There's no merit to this. The middle school is successful. The co-op is successful. It's what makes this, our two towns desirable and, and very healthy. The interesting thing in this presentation from the petitioner is that he talks about how the numbers are going up and our schools are overcrowded. And in the petition warrant article number one, the same evening, just not too long ago, he talked about how our numbers are going down and now we need a tax cap. I'm finding it a little confusing to see two completely alternate arguments. Frankly, if we lose his rationale that our numbers are going up and bond rates are low, it's much cheaper to do an addition than to build a brand new school in a separate town and then to have Brookline have a separate administrative cost for their own school furnace, all those fixed costs. We get a lot of synergy by having a combined school for middle school. You bring two towns together. It's great for the students, their ability to interact and work together. It builds, uh, it builds teamwork across the school, the classes that can, you can offer with that uh, cohort. It's a school with good enough size that you can do a lot we have a huge diversity of math and other programs and great offerings in sport and co-curricular. So I, I think there's no rationale at all for this, none whatsoever. And every argument given for it to me sounds completely ludicrous. Thank you. Thank you, David. Patrick uh, Haggerty. Patrick, you state your name again and your address. Yeah, Patrick Haggerty, 25 Parker Road, Brookline. Um, I also like to to raise my voice uh, against this Warren article. Um, it it just doesn't make financial sense uh, as somebody who lives in Brookline and pays Brookline taxes for us to support um, even two more grades with our current facilities and the prospect of adding on facilities on our own taxes 
and or even building new facilities and finding land and, and going through that entire process. Um, I can't imagine that getting school aid for Brookline alone does more benefit than getting school aid and bonds for Brookline and Hollis to do renovations or improvements or even replacements of buildings because we share that financial burden together, even if it's not, you know, 50 50 um, based on our individual towns tax rates. Uh, so that's what I have to say about that. Before I go, though, I also wanted to point out that for those folks who might be having problems raising their hand or they can't find the button, you have to leave full screen mode of Zoom. And on the bottom right corner on a desktop app, you'll see the list of people. And below that, on the, on the, on the right, is a little raise hand button. Uh, so if, if you're having trouble locating it, that's where it is. If not, they've given you the other options. I just wanted to state that. Thank you very much. I'm done. Thank you, Patrick. That's helpful. We have Jarrell Smith. Jarrell Smith. Uh, yep. Hi, Jarrell Smith, 42 uh, Rocky Pond Road in Brookline. Um, I definitely am voting. Um, want this to be um, a no vote. Um, I've been hearing constantly how um, Eric spends a lot of time giving, you know, sort of what I call surface um presentations and i'm constantly seeing him be the spokesperson for each of these warrant auto calls that are just frustrating everyone from both towns um this is literally one of those things that's ticking me off because what it's basically doing is there is a hollis brookline sort of fabric here that's trying to be unraveled and i think the majority of people don't want that to be the case. And this is one of those areas where we're trying to create this separation of the two towns is though we don't get along when in fact we truly do. So my kids are enjoying the kids from Hollis, the kids from Hollis to a certain extent are enjoying the kids from Brookline. I think we need to just figure out how we can basically just find a common sense way to basically get this thing moving forward and stop trying to separate the two, the two communities. Is, is pretty much driving this um, and, and it's it's starting to just tick me off if you really want to know the truth. Uh, that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. I would like us to, thank you so much for your comments. I'd like us to try to refrain from commenting about another commenter. Um, I have someone texted me that um, Robert Mann would like to speak. Yep. So I'm gonna let him go and then I'm gonna go to a person who's in person and then we'll go back to the Zoom. So, um, Robert Mann, Bob. Hi folks, I was looking for the mute button. Uh, so I'm just gonna be try to be very succinct here. I'm gonna talk about what I heard tonight, what I didn't hear. I heard I'm supposed to support a tax cap because of declining enrollment. And I've heard that I'm supposed to support realignment because of increasing enrollment. Uh, that's coming. So that's confusing. I saw NASDAQ uh, in data that was out like 27 years. I can tell you we plan on NASDAQ best within five years of that data. We do not, as a pra best practice, go beyond uh, roughly five years. So 27 years is ludicrous. Uh, I'm very concerned about the Brookline students and where they would go that would normally matriculate into the co-op. Um, I heard nothing about where they're going. Uh, I'm very concerned of that, about that. I didn't hear anything about change management, how we're going to implement and execute such a thing without messing up a year of the student's education. Didn't hear anything around that. I also didn't hear from our education professionals, I didn't hear of any impact study about how we do it, you know, and, and what impact that might take uh, on the students themselves during this change. So I, I, I'm just totally confused and totally not very clear as to what the point of this article is. Thank you. Mr. Mann, that was Rob Mann. He spoke earlier. He's back in the record. Tiffany, go ahead. Hi, I'm Tiffany Tesla, one on one, one of the um, I'm a math and science teacher, 
the rotation to statistics. I'm not confused at all about the use of data. You can use that data in any way you want. And I hope the community saw those two very different uses of the data. Um, that was, it, it could have been confusing, but not really. How can our numbers be going up and down and left and right? I don't know, but I do teach my students to look out for that kind of stuff. Uh, the thing that I hear in this, I saw it in the petition, I hear it now. This is a money thing, so I'm going to give a different perspective. That would be the perspective of the student. So, coming from education, developmentally, this, our, our program that we've had for a very long time makes absolutely sense. Not only that, but the middle school is probably one of the biggest trends in, in both communities. So, again, this is not, this shouldn't be divisive. We, we build bridges, and our middle school does exactly what it needs to do when our kids are at the age that they need it. So they're redefining themselves, they're going through all kinds of stuff. They make new friendships, they build bonds that last through high school, and our middle school works fine. And also the financial part, I just don't get it. Two new schools for two different taxes might go up. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. We have Aaron Pintasis. Okay, Aaron, you see your name again. Aaron. Go ahead, Aaron. Let me unmute. There we go. So Aaron Pinkasek, 133 Dow Road in Hollis. And um, the, the, uh, a lady earlier talked about the tax rate being flat. So we've been in this house in Hollis now for about five years. And in that period of time, our tax rate has gone up by 16.25%, which is 3.25% per year. Um, the bulk of it has gone to the school system, right? And so um, I, I know this is this is really not this article that we're talking about, maybe the previous one, right? But uh, she needs to understand that what she's saying is not true <laughs> for everybody in Hollis, right? And all of you need to understand that too. We should not be increasing taxes indiscriminately in this town, or you're going to lose your citizens and lose your tax income as a result of doing so. That's all. Thank you. We have Michelle St. John. Michelle St. John again. Go ahead, Michelle. Thank you. Um, I, I have to say that I echo uh, Mr. Sachs and Mr. Smith's um, and others in the flabbergasting idea of this this um, petition warrant. I just I, I don't understand. Our middle school is a jewel. Um, and um, the relationship students begin to have with teachers and with classmates from both towns. I have children who've gone through that district who are in the district, who um, are in the schools, who have been through the schools, and those relationships with the other students form at that time. I also want to say that there is no way we can depend on a school building aid fund. Um, I, I, again, am flabbergasted that we are told in one petition that we are have, have a decrease in population and another, another that it's going to go you know, out of the park and we need to make plans for that. Um, I also would like to say that I looked at the petition and who signed it. I didn't see a single Hollis resident sign the petition. And I wonder, I question how many people who signed that petition have students in the, that school district um, and understand what they're doing by pulling it apart. Who benefits from this? How are you going to pay for it? How is it going to impact the town and the community? So I completely, unequivocally oppose this. Thank you. So, we have Maureen Matheson. Maureen, go ahead. Name and address, please. Hi, thank you. Maureen again, Maureen Masterson, 60 Milton Place, Hollis. Yeah, I, uh, I agree with everything Michelle and uh, Mr. Sachs and Mr. Smith and Mr. Mann have said. Um, I won't repeat that, uh, but I will bring in a story. Um, I, I went to the Wilton Lineborough Cooperative Junior Senior High School, which is a sixth grade um, school uh, just nearby. And I, it was wonderful. As a 
fifth grader, as a sixth grader, I looked forward to merging with the other town of Wilton. I looked forward to going to that new school and getting to meet new friends and new people and expanding my, my, my fish tank, my sea. And I think our kids do too. I know our kids are excited to meet our, our, our fellow, um, their fellow classmates in the seventh grade. And it's going to be, it was very exciting for them. I think if anything, we should be expanding the co-op, not breaking it apart. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have Jillian Hinkle. Jillian. Hello, my name is Jillian Hinkle, 16 Hillside Drive. I just wanted to say about the NASDAQ study, I don't think it takes into account housing availability. Um, our districts, uh, both Hollis and Brookline, have extreme limitations on the amount of housing and how much can be built out. Um, and that study doesn't seem to take this into account, which makes the numbers that Mr. Sachs shared unlikely. Yes, go ahead. Jillian, you lose her? She just muted herself. We have um, Daniel Palmer. Daniel Palmer, state your name and address, please. Yes, hi. I hope you can hear me. Daniel Palmer, 167 North Pepperell Road, Hollis. I just want to quickly echo um, my support for what David Sachs said, what Michelle St. John said regarding this article, which I find equally ludicrous for all the reasons that they stated, so I won't repeat it. But um, I want to go back to something Barbara King also said about how we go through this over and over and over again. Every year, we have a small group of people who seem to put together these citizen pe petitions that are tremendous hot button topics that require all of this debate. And the vast majority of the time, these all, these all fail. And so I guess what I want to put out there, I don't know if it's possible. I don't know if the laws support it, but we have a school board in place for a reason. And perhaps the time has come that these citizen petitions have to first pass the school board. And if it doesn't, if it gets a, a no vote across the board from the school board, which I am 100% sure this is going to get, then we shouldn't have to waste our time hearing these kinds of arguments and seeing these kinds of presentations that we all know are going to go nowhere. This co-op and this school is extremely important to the town. It's what makes these towns great. We know that this isn't going to pass. And I hope that there could be a process put in place in the future that would prevent us from having to listen to some of these arguments if they don't even pass a basic uh, SNP test from our school board who has volunteered their time and has done a tremendous service for us. So that's all I want to say. I want to thank you very much. I know these are difficult circumstances and thank you for your effort and your time tonight. Colin. So we have three new hands and they're all repeat speakers. Okay. I don't know if anyone member of the board who wants to speak as a member of the public. So the member of the public. Okay, so that would be, and then I also have another person in public. So I'm going to take Liz, and then Mr. Gruba, and then the three people. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Ms. Well, we'll Brown. Just, uh, Elizabeth Brown, and Lady Boy. I do come to the mic, um, and I'm going to refer to something that was stated, because I want to make sure, as I said, I'm not the party speaker, but I want to make sure that the public gets to hear the factual information close in time to the time that the allegation was made that the tax rate in Hollis had increased over 15 percent in the last five years. Not at all what is the case. If you look back in 2016, the tax rate for Hollis was $23.44. The tax rate for 2021 is $23.15. That's actually a reduction, and I couldn't pass high school math. So I want to make sure that we understand what the facts are, and we're not just listening to uh, rhetoric. Um, and everybody has the capability of pulling their own tax bill. If you're in Hollis, go to the Hollis Town website. You can pull up your tax bill for all the last years, and you can figure out exactly how much your tax bill has gone up. Um, and look for the real facts about not what people are saying about the rhetoric. And tax rate does not always equate a higher tax bill because once the houses were reassessed, it's a calculation, and that's what results in the tax bill. Thank you, Ms. Brown. <coughs> Mr. Garuba, <coughs> you will be next. Thank you, Mr. Garuba, 28 Winchester Drive. 
I just want to point out a couple of things, uh, a couple of points. I want to speak in favor of this one article, but specifically, it's my understanding that um, affirmative vote on this article actually starts a study committee. Committee. It doesn't instantly dissolve the co-op. It's not even the article isn't even intending to dissolve the co-op. It's intending to just shift two grades from the co-op. Um, the other thing is there's a lot of a lot of discussion about the NASDAQ projections, and specifically because of um, because of the wider implications of COVID, I think those NASDAQ projections, which are showing a considerable increase, I wouldn't be surprised to find that those NASDAQ projections are low because of the amount of development that we're going through in town now. And the, the last thing I want to point out here is that um, the closer decisions are made at the local level, meaning the more, um, let's say, meaning the Holland School Board as opposed to the co-op board, the, the more local decisions are, the more people have influence or direct, more direct influence over decisions. So any shifting of students or grades from the co-op to the Hollis district will give Hollis and, and as well as Brookline residents more influence directly over the education of children in those grades. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and we have some repeats. Okay, go ahead. We have Jillian Hinkle. Oh yes, Jillian's not a repeat. She actually gets to start her again. Um, Jillian, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Jillian, are you there? Oh, yes. Jillian? Am I now unmute? <laughs> we were, you were, it kept on remuting for me. It kept on saying, <laughs> so I don't know how that was happening. Apologies. Jillian Hinkle, 16 Hillside Drive. I just wanted to say that the NESDEC report doesn't take into account housing availability, which is very limited in both Hollis and Brookline. So the likelihood that we would actually achieve the increases that are being predicted seems very unlikely, um, which leaves me not in support of this warrant. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jillian. Thank you. And who else do we have? We have David Sack. David, again, Mr. Sack. Yeah, hi. Uh, different question for the board or legal counsel, uh, what is, where do we get the minimum number of people required for a petition and what would be the process to raise it? So I guess I'm going to let the legal counsel answer that because I'm not an expert on this. But it is 25 people is, is the minimum. And Jim, that's not something that can be changed, is it? Well, it can be, but not by us. Uh, is Jim there? Is that state law? Is that something that we can have a law, a rule in Hollis for Hi, I can, I can, I, I can answer Holly. Um, you, you pretty much had it already. The, the governing laws RSA 197 colon six. And um, it basically says that it's a written application of 25 or more voters or 2% of the voters of the district, whichever is less. Um, so you'd have to change the statute is basically the answer. And, you know, we're going to end up talking about this, I, I feel, at some point um, since we're on the topic. But the, um, the RSA 197.6 actually creates a legal right for the petitioners to have their petition warrant article placed on the warrant, provided that the petition article itself isn't illegal. Um, there are very limited circumstances where um, petition articles are actually illegal. And um, so barring an illegal petition warrant article, there is a right to have it on the warrant. And right now there's not, uh, there's not any way to change that process. Thank you, Jim. David, yep. does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you both. Thank you. Is there someone else? We have a John G. John G. Okay. John, can you Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, I just need your name and address okay. for the record. Yeah, no problem. My name is uh, Jonathan Garuba at 30 Meadow Drive, Hollis. 
Um, I'd just like to, to offer my sentiment. I've heard several comments uh, talking about restricting uh, residents' rights to, to raise petitions. And I think that's certainly the wrong way to go to try and, and take away uh, rights that are, are been in place for a long time. And, and frankly, I'm, I'm concerned that people would want to add, um, just take away control from, from the individual town residents that vote. So I just wanted to raise that. Thank you. Thank you, John. Then. Is there anyone else? Uh, we have Eric Power. Mr. Power. Yes, this is Eric Power. I just wanted to mention um, when I was showing the projections, I was showing not the same projections. The co-op is going down in population. And that is true. It'll eventually go up long term. The projections I'm showing about the K through six, that's where there's going to be a rapid increase, especially in Hollis. And Hollis is going to run out of space if these projections are true. And I understand the school board, I was on the school board previously at five years is, uh, you know, the reliable one, but you have to, you can't just dismiss what's happening beyond those numbers. I think you have to plan for that. And so I'd rather have us be a little proactive in this. This is this process will take many years to complete. And I think it's just wise to be able to look at it and determine what the facts are. And, and then we'll also have a better idea what's happening with the population. So yes, the population in the K through six is increasing and the population in the seven through 12 is decreasing. Eventually the seven through 12, we'll see that bubble and it will also increase. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Power. Is there anyone else? We have Michelle St. John. Okay, Michelle, go ahead. I, I'll just be very brief. I just wanted to say something about the petition articles. And while I understand what the last gentleman said, I appreciate what Mr. Sachs said in regards to the same group of people bringing the same petitions, which causes the late night and the arguing back and forth and the discussion. Because there, a lot of these petitions are you know, some, sometimes I, I just wonder what is the intent of these petitions? What is the intent to do to our co-op? And year after year, and that's what causes frustration and that's what causes division. Um, the other comment I wanted to make about, um, everyone's talking about NASDAQ and numbers and people moving in. There is an ebb and flow of the housing market and individuals who are in our town. People come to the town and I know this can be argued in a negative way, but people come here to raise a family and to have children. And then many people move on. Their children move to the West Coast, they move to the West Coast. They wanna to go to warmer weather, they move to warmer weather. They have a dream home on a lake, they move to a lake. You know, this is what society does. And so to just say to everyone that, you know, we're, we're going to blow up and explode, we have a finite number of uh, space here. We have a finite number of houses, new housing coming in with the zoning laws that we have. We have 55 plus people coming in. We don't have major um, housing developments being built. People choose to conserve the land and put it into protection rather than build, you know, gigantic housing developments. We're not Nashua. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Davidson has risen. Yes, uh, Davidson, 85 Rider Road in Hollis. Uh, the first thing, I'm not sure where I am on this petition one, to be quite honest with you. So I haven't decided whether I'm in favor of it or not. Right? But as Mr. Sala pointed out earlier, the process is a multi year process. And if it were to pass, what Clay may believe would say, if it were to pass, we would go through many deliberative years of whether this was the right thing to do, and if it was, how we would do it. And as you mentioned, not unlike what the process would be for changing the co-op or leaving the co-op, which is which I don't see this as saying that it okay. So so to me, I think it's it, 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 the argument is, is proven if you agree with it. I'm not sure if I do. Okay. The other thing is I gotta tell you, I wasn't gonna get up there and even speak to this article, but I am shocked, I am absolutely shocked that so many people are against having the voices of the voters heard. The warrant petition mechanism is a legal mechanism in this state. It's run by state law. And for anybody to say whether it happens year after year or not, 
that when you get enough sufficient names of registered voters to sign a warrant that it shouldn't be heard or it should be deferred to the school board to me as a model and it's undemocratic. And I think you need to really take a sober look at some of the remarks we heard regarding that. I don't agree with every warrant article that comes up, clearly I don't. I'm against many of them. But to say that people don't have a voice or shouldn't have a voice to me is just a problem. Thank you. Sure. Mr. I'm not a lawyer, I'm a student, student of the lawyer for quite a few time. And the way the article is written, if we change, if this were approved, it would change the structure of the co-op. What the multimedia process is how it occurs, and it would have to go through an iterative process before it was approved by the voters and the state. But it is not uh, an upper bound. This is the upper bound. If this gets voted up, then the article changed, but it's multiple years before the change occurs because of the process to establish an the dissolution of the middle school co-op occurs. So it's different than if you were to try and dissolve the co-op, which does trigger a, a three-year process, and then there's an up and down vote at the end of that. This is an up or down vote in the beginning. Yeah, Tom, the uh, viewers on Zoom are having to call back in. Uh, the wording as all this, it, it lacks the phrases that say that there is any point other than having to go back and rework the process until we can get to the line. It must be anything in the clause of the co-op article agreement that I have a hard time actually hearing what I think that's that's Tom talking. I, I can't totally understand. I'm sorry. So I think Tom's point is that there's no because of the way the articles of agreement are written, um, Article 15 doesn't really give the committee or group any other exit ramp, if you will, except for the removing seventh and eighth grade. Um, am I saying that very close? And so there's no exit ramp other than this. I like the yeah. wording. I like the wording in the RSA, which gives certain points where it can be voted and all again. The wording in our community of our agreement say that if it is not approved by the state or if it is not approved by one of the panels, then it goes back to the committee to rework and resubmit. I did not see any language in the article of agreement that say that a no vote or a rejection of the plan cancels the process. So that's the result of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I. I can't hear him perfectly well, but I I actually understand what Tom's saying. Um, this this part of this part of the cooperative school district statute one RSA one ninety five um, was a was a subject of a, a legislative study committee a couple of years ago. Um, I was a appointed member of that committee, so I spent a lot of time uh, talking about the process for um, for dissolution or withdrawal in cooperative school districts. And one of the major talking points was that um, once the process started, is there a way for um, the committee to basically stop the process if they determine that it's not feasible or not worthwhile to continue pursuing um, the withdrawal or, or you know, dissolution of a cooperative school district? Um, the law does provide su such a such a process. The committee early on can take a vote um, to basically stop if it determines it's not feasible. Um, that Tom is right, I believe. If what he's saying is that the Article 15 process does not contain a provision, it basically requires that the um, 
uh, that the that the the grade reduction committee is responsible for studying the process and formulating a plan, and that they are responsible for bringing that plan forward and ensuring that it is placed on the warrant for a vote at some point in time. So, if this is approved, uh, there will at some point in the future be a plan uh, for the reduction of grades that is put before the voters of the cooperative school district. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Mr. Davidson, up again. Yeah, just quick, Doug Davidson, 85 right out. Yeah, that's, that's basically what I was gonna say. The point is, is that there are many exit ramps that are possible. And the, one of the most possible is if the committee comes back and says, hey, you know, this isn't workable or the conditions under which we passed it two years ago, five years ago, whatever, whatever the time is, really have changed. And we want to do it a different way now. That option is still there, okay, to change it. And then the other option is to just reject it, to have another warrant and say, the, the reason why we put that in place no longer exists, so we want to change it. So there are, the point is there's many opportunities to reverse or change it or modify it. Anyone else would like to comment on? Yeah, so we've had hands go up and down and up and down. Um, some of we have not heard from. The hand is down, but it was up for a long time. So, sure, let's see. If they um, Lori. Lori, just, just Lori. Just Lori. Okay, there is a person, Lori, who wanted to comment who has not raised their hand anymore. But are you still interested? If you are, we will unmute you. Sure. Hello? What's your last? Oh, Lori. I know Hi, it's Lori Miller. I'm so sorry. My uh, iPad just has my first name. Um, one point I just would like to make is, whoops, I'm sorry. Lori Miller, 14 Forest View Drive in Hollis. Um, one point I just like to make is um, this, we, we talk about having this study committee. Who, who is going to be doing the work? And aren't they already taxed with dealing with the pandemic right now. I think it's it's really inappropriate to be asking um, our school board and our um, SAU administration to add on yet one other item onto their plate that's already full of other things. Um, and I will just, that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Is there anyone else? Um, we have Barbara King. Barbara, again. Hi, Barbara King, 15 Barton Road in Hollis. Um, I had a question. So can next year, say this passes, can next year uh, the same petition warrant article be put on where they say to take ninth and 10th out of the co-op? Is that a possibility? Um, yes. Did you just, I'm sorry, I was, they were shifting furniture on. Did you just ask, is it, is it possible for them to next year if this fails to go for ninth and 10th? Yeah. No, if it goes forward seventh and eighth, the next year, because everyone's saying, oh, it's just a study. Next year, it's let's take ninth and 10th out of the co-op. Is that a possibility? Yes, that's a possibility. So this <laughs> effectively becomes another way to disband the co-op. And mm -hmm. I, you know, for all the taxpayers and all the property owners, I encourage you to not support this if you like your property value, because just studying breaking up the co-op will impact our property values. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Is there anyone else? Yep, so we have a, a repeat, but we have um, a, a new person who hasn't spoken to this article, Mallory Rizlar. I would like Mallory to speak first and then we'll go to repeat. Mallory Rizlar, 14 Hobart Hill Road in Brookline. Um, I just wanted to echo even off of what Barbara even just finished saying. Um, I was at the meeting last year um, in Brookline where we had to vote on the feasibility study to break up the co-op. And I think where a lot of the frustration comes from um, is so last year it was breaking up the co-op the entire high school. Now this year we're going after the middle school. It's just the continuous question of what's next. Um, and that's what I think people should also be thinking of when they're deciding what to vote for. It's um, 
we really need to think about where these ideas are coming from and what's the source for them and uh, what is the larger idea. Thank you. This was um, we have another, one more person. Michelle St. John. Michelle St. John. Uh, I just want to end with saying, you know, it's not broke. What are we trying to fix? Are we trying to break something or are we trying to fix something with this petition warrant? I just want the folks that are on this call tonight when you're talking to other individuals um, about this petition warrant, is there something broken in this co-op? I, I think the answer to that is no. So why would we want to break it up? Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else? Any other hands raised? Have you guys received any emails or texts from anyone who seems like they are not able to get it? Any more hands? I'm assuming no one's going to email me, but oh, we have a hand. We've also posted on the Halls for Blind Community page so you can comment back. Okay. We have, like the okay. we have Daniel Palmer. Okay. Is he the last one? At the moment, yes. Yeah. Okay. So yes, hi. I'll be very, hi. I'll be very brief. I just want to follow up on the point I made. Some people commented that it's anti democratic. I'm certainly not anti democratic. There is already procedures in place by law where these petition articles have to gain some sort of traction before they can be put in front of the citizens. It appears to be 25 people have to sign on and there are 14,000 or whatever residents between these two towns. So it's obviously an incredibly easy, um, easy thing to achieve to get these petitions on that are in a lot of times, to Michelle's point, a, a time waste for a lot of people because we know what the end result is going to be. So I'm not in any way advocating that there is no, uh, there's, you know, no way to get these petitions in front of the, the community, but I am wondering, and I do not know the answer, but I am wondering if there's a way to increase the, um, the barriers, if you will, what, what has to be accomplished to get these petitions in front of the voters. I'm happy to support democracy, but I'm also not interested in wasting my time and so I'm just curious if there is anything that can be done legally and where that would have to be done to put a little bit, to figure out a way to put a little bit more, um, I don't know what the, what the right word is, some writer I am, but uh, to put a little more uh, criteria um, that you have to pass before these, these articles get put before the entire community. That's my only point. Thank you so much again for your time. Well, to answer your question, that, that certainly is not under the purview of the board, changing that law. Go ahead, Jeff, Mr. Gruber. Jeff Gruber, for me, which is Um I just wanted to kind of frame this in the sense of this isn't a question and answer session about state law here, so I just wanted to bring that point up. Thank you, Mr. Gruber. Are we set? I think so. Okay, at this point, I'm going to close public comment at 8.17 p.m. on Petition Warrant Article 3. And I will open the floor after I read it for Petition Warrant Article 4. I'm going to take my mask off. This is long. Shall SAU 41 and the Hollis of the Cooperative School by school, Schools hereby affirm our general support for each student's broken enrichment and support thereof, we, the legislative body, hereby state the following as a matter of family policy. A. The family union is ideally at the core of each individual's social, educational, intellectual, and emotional well being. B. Our schools are a critical element that shall foster an environment where our goal is that all students are enabled to thrive and possibly achieve the potential and develop the content of their character accordingly. C. It shall be the primary goal of all country unions here to support these efforts. D, any devices, devices and policies that foster the principles of discrimination, segregation, stereotyping, intimidation, censorship, harassment, or recognition based on race or sex is by the nature of a threat or social fabric, morally wrong and generally unlawful. E, further educational techniques that hinder or prevent fairness, impartiality, equality of all you speak up with, or conversely, support equity, support absence of equity. Redesign, equity based outcomes, redistribution, retribution, unlearning, or critical race theory are by their nature detrimentally counterproductive to healthy education and the unifying ideals of our greater American society. 
F, any part parties so wrong may seek court relief under applicable federal and state laws through and with RSA 34, three, sorry, RSA 354-A, anti-discrimination, RSA 91-A, the right to know at all, not noting the enforcement and penalty provisions provided therein. Therefore, we, the legislative bodies of SAU 41 and the Hollis for Fine Cooperative Schools, with our vote, hereby affirm that this article be published and made an integral part the policy of our school administrative unit and cooperative school <coughs> district. Um, that is Petition Warrant Article 4, and we have a presentation on this by Doug Davidson. I will open the floor and have Doug begin. You have five minutes exactly. Thank you very much for letting me to speak. Uh, just for Background check, uh, I'm a former high school teacher. I taught Appalachian Cultural Studies. I've been the ranking member of the Budget Committee here in the co-op, and I'm a member also of a mixed race, multi-generational family, including uh, people born on every continent, except in Antarctica and Australia, and also a part Abenaki and part Cherokee. So anti-discrimination versus critical race theory in our schools. Next slide, please. So I grew up in the 60s, and if there was one message that came out of the 60s, it was what Dr. Martin Luther King taught us. I dream of a day when my poor children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. That is a great part of the essence of why this petition was filed. Where are we uh, relative to realizing that dream yet? I don't know, but you can ask Alameda King, Dr. Ben Carson, Michael Jordan, Charles Payne, Candace Owens, Morgan Freeman, and Clarence Thomas, their opinion on how far we've come in several generations relative to Dr. King's treatment is, I think, worth considering. Next slide, please. We're seeing in the schools with the DEI committee and critical race theory around the country the, the debate of equity versus equality. I'm missing a bullet there. Can you scroll it up, please? Yeah, okay, so equity versus equality and outcome versus opportunity. They use the analogy of the DEI meeting the other day like a hundred meter race. So uh, equality means that we all get to the starting line at the same time. The gun race starts and then we finish first, second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever. Equity means that we all get to the starting line and we all finish at the same time. Okay, so that's part of the whole critical race theory and DEI strategy here. So it's outcome driven versus opportunity driven. We're looking for common outcomes and not unlike we were looking at common core driving the least common denominator in terms of uh, avoiding or hindering uh, achievement. So the court race analogy is, uh, is really the difference between equity and equality and the difference between common outcome versus common opportunity. That's the, that's the dichotomy here. Next slide, please. So to affect critical race theory and to affect the DEI strategy, you have to look at everything for a prison of racism. So you're looking at identity politics in society. You're looking at defining groups and victims, those that are dominant, those that are subordinate. And the basic premise is all of our laws and our legal institutions are inherently racist. These inequalities need to be corrected and the norms that we look at today need to be changed. In that process, public and private bonds within communities are grossly weakened. And so we go through a process that's not Socratic or that's not discovery, but that's more of an indoctrination. And I received a letter today where that concern was expressed by a parent who uh, will see some of the goings on in their child's classroom that they saw through the Zoom meetings. Next slide, please. The other critical elements are, again, race-based, white people force of differences that create inequality, systemic prejudice and subjugation. So my question is, where's the years of racism documentation that have been going on here in the cooperative district or in the entire SAU? I think that if indeed we have systemic racism in the schools, not only should we look at every person in this room and every person in the community, but certainly administrators and the teachers. I for one don't think that situation exists. If there are situations where you have some kid putting a swastika in a bathroom or being prejudiced towards one kid or another, those are isolated incidents. But if we've had a systemic race problem in this community, then we should indict all of ourselves, all of our administrators, and all of our teachers, because that documentation hasn't been published, those incident reports haven't occurred, and those police complaints have not been made. 
So the end game is to make this process of racial, di racial dichotomy part of their end game and to normalize that negative discourse. And the methodologies that they use are traditional ones that you see with the Red Guards, Olinsky, and the BLM. Next slide, please. So here's the slide from, uh, that we saw in San Jose talking about exactly what I just said. Next slide, please. Here's the same thing. Next slide, please. And then here's the slides that were sent to us, the comments that were sent to us by a parent given their recent concerns. All right, these are events dated and the quotes that he wrote down during the various meetings and in the interactions with their child. Next slide, please. Five minutes until the event. Go, can you go, can you go to the last slide? Five minutes. I gave you five minutes. Okay, you can't go to the last slide. All right, uh, this will be published on the web. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. So please support this warrant petition. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, at this point, I'd um, like to open the floor for comment. Um, Who is Philip? Who do we have? Philip Stevens. Philip Stevens, please state your name and address. Hello, uh, my name is Philip Stevenson. I live at 262 Hayden Road, Hollis, New Hampshire. Uh, thank you for allowing me a chance to speak. Um, so my understanding is, or not my understanding of, I've actually looked into it, spoken to a lot of people on the committee that this Warren article is in response to, uh, was a committee that the superintendent put together uh, to help address uh, requests from the students who actually have actually recorded a lot of their own instances of um, experiences that they've had, uh, uh, negative experiences um, with respect to diversity uh, and, and inclusion. Uh, and there's been a group of people from across the political spectrum, across the, the spectrum of views, working together for months on this to come together and put together language that is acceptable to a broad array of people, but that also addresses uh, the fact that this is a real issue um, and that uh, we need to address it and create ways for people to talk about it. And if you speak to the members of that group of a variety of viewpoints, they say that's exactly what happened just being in the committee and the result of their work is to strengthen and to press that forward. Um, and I think that the, the pre presentation we just showed and the sort of wild references that are way out of what, why this was put together and what it's meant to address demonstrates that it's you know, addressing this sort of paranoid, um, I don't even know what to call it, uh, view of the intentions of people who want to make sure that those who um, are being left out or, or, uh, uh, or, or where there are situations where people just felt like they're being left out need to have and should have uh, our support as a community. Thank you very much. Minutes are up. We have Terrell Smith. Mr. Smith, um, please state your name and address. Terrell, oh, are you there? Hi. Did it work? Yep. Um, yep. Thank you, uh, Terrell Smith, 42 Rocky Pond Road in Brookline. And Chairperson, uh, my apologies for calling out a person in the last last comment I made. Um, what I, I think the gentleman just before me basically mm -hmm. said it well, so I'm really just um, reiterating what he said, the the intent of the DEI committee really is to look at, um, to a certain extent, how do we basically give students inside of our school system the resources they need where they're at, regardless of the rest of the school body to help them to be able to achieve their goals at the highest level without feeling like they have to be demeaned in order to get there. Um, that That is pretty much the gist of it. It's not just based on race. It, it's based on all of our students, those that we might say are advantage to those that might be disadvantaged. How do we give each of those different groups the resources they need to excel to the level that they truly want to be at? That's really what we're trying to, 
to do. And it's not just based, it's not just based on race. It's, it's based on the individual students and what they need. Okay, thank you. Um, I have, I've received texts by two members of the Zoom call. I don't know if they can do the chat, but Natalie Hattayan and Robert Mann are both um, need to be in the list of people who want to speak. Um, I also have a member of the public in person who'd like to speak, and I have some other members. So, um, Gina, who were you going to put up? Joe, I'm going to get a couple people on Zoom, and then I'll get to you. Um, Kat McGee. Kat McGee. Go ahead, Kat. Kat. Yes, thank you. Thanks. I wasn't able to unmute, but there you go. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say um, I actually participated in the DEI public call um, last year and was very impressed with the work that I heard the group that had been together for several months doing. And I see this um, petition warrant article as in competition for being able to outline what it is that the schools are going to come up with. Um, and I was a little confused by the wording on this, but I had a question actually for Mr. Shaughnessy. Um, I have put petition warrant articles in in the town of Hollis before, and they have a template for warrant articles that require that your signatures be on the same page with the wording of the warrant so that they can be sure that the people who've provided their signatures are signing the content of the warrant that you have. And this is not done in that format. So is it considered a legal warrant the way that it's been presented? Jim, are you there? Can you answer that question? Yeah, yeah you, um, you know, I, it's it's a little bit of, of, of first of all, Hall's Brookline doesn't have that process um, requirement, but also when I read the heading at the top of the signature pages, it says that said petition included herein by reference. Um, you know, so then it becomes like, you know, do, do I really have a legal basis for saying it's not a, a lawful, lawfully signed petition? Um, and, you know, so we, the, the district doesn't take that position. I don't think the clerk of the district took that position when they reviewed or whomever reviewed uh, the signatures to ensure that they conformed with the uh, elected of the, the uh, registered voters. So I, I don't I don't think it's it's illegal for it to be a valid petition warrant article. Okay. And then there's one more question that I have then about um, about the way that it's formulated because it does seem to want to have the legislative body, which I guess is the people who organize the warrant uh, mm -hmm. are thinking they're speaking for us, uh, all of us, uh, in saying that they want to have relief whereby they can, sue the schools if the schools don't implement these words um, the way they think is correct. So uh, is that something that uh, a petition can actually impose on schools and a school board and officials and authorities that we have that we're paying for public services? Um, well, so there's a, there's a lot of different questions there. What I'll say is, um, again, the, the uh, a petition warrant article, the default rule is you put it on the on the warrant unless it's illegal. And a petition warrant article is illegal, for example, if it if it attempts to give the governing body or the school board authority to take an action that's that's not legal, um, or or that's not authorized by law. Mm -hmm. um, this petition warrant article, I did review it with um, my client. It it's it it doesn't purport to give the board authority to do something illegal. So there wasn't a clear basis not to put it on the warrant, but I have mm -hmm. to say it came somewhat close to that yeah. um, just because some of the language, although possibly well-intentioned, um, mm -hmm. does suggest uh, a limitation on how the district teaches uh, anti-discrimination. Right. Um, however, it did, it did pass the legal test. Um, however, um, this petition warrant article is most definitely advisory only. Um, it, it will have no binding effect whatsoever on the school board if it passes, um, because the legislative body does not have legal authority to define the educational policy of the school district. That's what uh, I thought. Yeah, educational policy making is 
by law, um, the duty, responsibility, obligation of the school board uh, that you mm -hmm. elect and not the legislative body. So it's really a, um, a it's a, you know, do, is, is this what the voters sort of want uh, to happen, but it's not binding. And finally, it, it doesn't create a private mm -hmm. right of action or a new cause of action for voters uh, to seek additional legal relief that isn't already available. If it's available under the law, then it's available. This doesn't create any new rights um, for, uh, for citizens in the community. Yes, and it says that in here. It says if you want any relief for anti-discrimination, go to this law. <laughs> so it doesn't really. Chet, you have like 10 seconds left of speaking. I'm gonna let, I, I appreciate the question and answer because some of these questions I was actually gonna ask Jim. But if you have a final point, you might want to make it. What happened? Did you unmute myself? Okay. So you've been accidentally muted. We're going to unmute you right now. Got it. Pat, are you there? Oh. Oh, yes. I mean, I, <laughs> I don't want to belabor the point. I just think in the body of the uh, article, it does quote that RSA 354A is the anti-discrimination law that would cover anyone who felt harmed or who wanted to take action. Okay, thank you. I think we've got our answer, but I just want to clarify that, Jim, the point Jim made is that this is advisory only. Um, and I think the public just needs to understand that if this were to pass, um, it is advisory, right? That's the difference. Okay. So um, I believe. Um, oh, Joe, Joe, Joe. Sorry, I did not forget you. Well, actually, I kind of did, but Mr. Solon <laughs> helped me out there. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joe Gruber, 28, Winchester Drive. I'm speaking in favor of the Warren article um, to reject critical race theory. Critical race theory is a flawed concept which leads to perpetual division by a rejection of all authority structures. It does not differentiate between benevolent restrictions like those imposed by parents on their children or the benevolent, benevolent authority of the school board. It portrays all authority as oppression. It perpetuates division by dividing people into various identity groups and seeks to group ideas by identity. Other school districts that have embraced this theory have gone to such measures as declaring merit-based decisions as racist based simply on the race of those, of those in authority, bans on cultural appropriation, such as Italian cooks selling Mexican food and similar divisions based on race, are the result of this flawed theory. This is the opposite of what I want, what I believe in and what I want to teach my children. I believe people and ideas should be judged by their merit, and I believe people should be encouraged to work together and value their differences. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rubin. Um, I do want to, just for the record, this public comment section opened at 8.19 a.m. I want John to be able to hear that. PM, sorry, not AM. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like <laughs> Okay, um, so we have some more. I see Tiffany's rising, but I said Natalie Chayan, Rob Mann, and then some other people. Who and there's the one with the hand up. Um, but I believe I, I wrote down Aaron Pintasic before you told me about Natalie Chayan. Okay, so we'll do Aaron first, then Natalie, and then Rob, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Aaron. Okay, I'm here. So thank, thank you for uh, letting me comment on this. Um, couple of thoughts on this. One, one of the big things, and I've been involved in this whole um, DEI thing uh, in various ways over the last six months or so. Um, one of the big things that bothers me is the uh, word equity versus equality. And so they're very different in terms of what they mean. Equality means that each student is afforded the same opportunity to succeed as the other students are. Equity means that each student is guaranteed the same outcome, regardless of their effort. And those are very different. And I've, I've been harping on this, you know, in my 
communications about this about this um, curriculum for a while now, and no one seems to recognize that that's the case. I think it's important. Uh, this is not somebody earlier said it felt like something with respect to the those of us who were opposing uh, this curriculum. It's not about feeling like, it's about what makes sense. It's about facts. And, and the whole cancel culture um, that's going on right now, we shouldn't erase American history. We should recognize that it happened. It's not all good. I got that. And, but, but we shouldn't cancel it. We should teach the students what happened because that's how we, that's how we prevent mistaking the same things in the future. We should, we should teach what happened and not cancel it. Thank you. It, it, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll stop, I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Um, I think Natalie Hattayan is next on our list. Yes. There, um, yeah, my name is Natalie Hattayan. Um, I live at 24 Powers Road. Um, I'm, you know, I just wanted to stop in here and I have to say like, I, I grew up in the school system, I'm 23 years old. And, and I saw this petition, I've never spoken up at a school board meeting before, but I really felt like I had to say something because, you know, as someone who grew up going to the school system and I'm not far out of it, I, you know, graduated in 2015. Um, I have to say it does a huge disservice um, to students like myself to not um, acknowledge the blind spots um, in, and, and to acknowledge critical race theory. Um, and you know, I, I think there's this conversation happening around like, are these reported or, or, or why haven't students come forward? Where are the police reports? And I think that it's um, very fair and honest of us um, to say, well, well, maybe we don't have systems in place that make it easy for students to report. Um, earlier this year, there was um, on the Facebook page, I mean, really countless experiences being told by students about their experience um, in the school system um, revolving um, race. And I have to say, as someone who graduated and then went out and got a job, and, and I, I really, there was a lot that I didn't learn um, in that there weren't conversations around about my own blind spots as a, a person, of uh, a white person. And I just think that opening this door up in the school system in, in, in at Hall's Brookline would literally only make for more open and honest conversations around race and um, I just don't think it could do any harm to have these conversations when they're out there in the real world you leave and and you're confronted with these things and why not have a healthy open conversation in the school district why why, why wait until we get to the world to figure it out on our own you know so and I just wanted to say that um, and stop in as as someone who wishes this, you know, I have to say, I just think this petition does students a disservice because they're going to be confronted with all these things once they leave. Thank you, Natalie. And um, Rob, Rob Mann, you're up next. Rob? Yeah, I, yeah I'm searching for the uh, mute. Uh, I uh, Misunderstanding, I, I don't wish to speak to the initiative. However, I wish Madam Chair just to point out that this is still in committee under the superintendent's um, auspices. This has not come before any of the school boards under SAU 41. Um, and I speak because I'm a member of one of the boards. So just for folks who don't know. So I just wanna add that and that's all I, that's it, thank you. Thank you, Rob, that's a good clarification to make that the Hollis Brooklyn Cooperative School Board does not have oversight over the body of the SAU 41. They, it's not how it works. So thanks, Rob. And Rob is the chair of the Hollis School Board. Okay, um, I'm gonna let Tiffany speak next and then I assume there's some others. Okay, Ms. Testa. Tiffany Testa on one more Tiffany, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Thank right. you. <laughs> um, I want to speak to two points. The first is that there were some absolutely false uh, statements that were made previous, so I want to make note of those for the community because 
I realize that this work is hard and this work is confusing and there's a lot of terms. Why do I realize that? Because there was a group of eight of us with extremely diverse views that came together and have worked collaboratively in a bridge building process to define these terms for our town. And I absolutely encourage the community to go and look at all of the minutes of the work that's been done. And also for the many members of the community that came out and spoke, um, we heard them. So the thing that's wrong is that there isn't a visual on there that shows a race that shows equity as the as the outcome, as the equal outcome. What there is is there's a visual on there that shows equity as equal opportunity. But I don't want to talk about the visuals. I want to talk about the real education. And the truth is, is that equity in education is defined as and is also defined in the statement that we have made of this group as equal opportunity, not equal outcome. So there's a grant. So to put this one article is really just a slap in the face of the process. And I think the community, community members that are concerned should join the work. This is a partisan, divisive um, warrant article that's out there. So I'll speak again in a second. Thanks, Tiffany. Okay, we have Todd Porter. Todd Porter, Todd, can you hear me? I can. Great, we can hear you now. Go All ahead right. and take Todd Porter, uh, 24 Cameron Drive in Hollis. So I, I wanted to speak to this, uh, this Warren article. Um, you know, number one, make the point that, you know, within this article, I, I believe we are setting our dangerous precedent of um, a small group of people, relatively small, attempting to, you know, leverage their point of view on the community. Um, I, I think that there is, um, you know, references to censorship here. I, I, I fear that um, that is the, the way that this is headed. It, once we say we can't teach certain things, uh, you know, that becomes a dangerous precedent to set. Uh, I also think that, you know, in terms of the way the article's written, there are a lot of terms there in quotations that aren't uh, adequately defined. I think, you know, we haven't really been given the, the background in terms of what those, what those terms are for a lot of people that are reading this for the first time. So I think, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of alarmist language in the presentation that we had up front in terms of uh, what this means and how we must protect, you know, our children. And I, I think that just becomes a, uh, a, a vehicle for that group of people to be able to leverage their point of view on, on and, and dictate what the schools teach. Uh, and I, I do, I'm, I'm obviously against that. And I think, you know, in terms of the way the language is written, it, it is very, it reads as very mom and apple pie, but hidden within this is, is, is a lot of dangerous concepts, a lot of uh, attempts at censorship and, and thought policing. And I think uh, I, I am firmly against this and I, I would encourage you to, to, uh, to uh, vote similarly. Thank you. We have John G. John G. John G. John G. Okay. John, are you there? John. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Please okay. Name. Jonathan Garuba, 30 Meadow Drive. Um, I'd just like to say that CRT is a fundamentally flawed idea. idea. Correcting and solving inequality cannot be done through a process which institutionalizes grouping of peoples by identity. That, in a, that process in and of itself is inherently discriminatory and contradictory. I reject racism of all types and accepting CRT will lead to unintended consequences. Thank you. Thank you. Someone else, anyone else? Okay, so we have a repeat, but we have a new one. We have Katie. Katie, so let's let Katie go first before we have a repeat. Do we have someone that, and you would like to speak to, sir, out there? Okay, so you'll come up after. Is there a couple more? We're going to do Katie, and then we'll do you, sir. Katie? Hi, uh, Katie Parik, 8 Peterson Road, Brookline. Um, you know, I just wanted to talk about the um, point one in the article about the family unit being at the core, which when you read it at first glance seems like a really nice idea, but 
um, you know, for me, after I thought about it a little bit, I think that's actually, it, it's, it's a little bit discriminatory against, like, say, kids who don't have a really stable family unit, you know, children in um, foster care or something like that. Um, it just, I think if we word something like this into our school culture, then you're going to be leaving those kids out and they're going to feel like what like they have some sort of less chance for success because they don't have the stable family unit at the core of their experience. I really think, you know, the core of the child's experience is the child themselves. Um, and then, you know, I, I do, I do feel that the language in part E is, is like a motion for censorship. And I just really do not support any of this. So that's what I wish to say. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Okay, sir, the person who's here in the flesh, good. Come on up. Thank you. My name is David Warner, 148 Ridge Road, beautiful town of I'm also on the DEI Commission. Uh, this has nothing to do with the work of the DEI Commission. I'm a little bit surprised that anybody would connect it to. It has to do with a theory of racism called critical race theory. It's also known by another name called building equity. A young student in second grade reported that they first were brought into the classroom and then were given an oppression test, is what the child called it. They were given uh, words and they were asked to say which was the oppressor and which was the oppressed. The list was first on the list was white people, second was American government, third was Christianity, uh, and so on. And the answer was in each case, each of those was an oppressive group. And the philosophy of critical race theory is, is that our entire country is white privilege, white racism. We need to take down the Constitution, we need to take down Christianity, and we need to replace it with something else. The third stage of the critical race theory is after you get the kids to admit that they are either a member of the oppressive class or the oppressor, that they then go through an unlearning process. The unlearning process tells them to tear down the Constitution, tear down Christianity, forget what mom and dad told you, and trust the teacher to guide you to what? To an equitable outcome. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. What I'm asking people to do by this warrant is wake up to this critical race theory. It is a national movement. It's not anything to do with this DEI commission. It is an offensive and vile approach going after second and third grade. There's a wealth of ideas out there that are much superior to that. The young lady who talked about discussing racism, I agree. I came from California. The kids around here are clueless about what's really going on in the world of racial. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, do we have, we have a Kathy? Okay, Kathy. Kathy. Hi, uh, this is this is Kathy Grossman, uh, 140 Ridge Road in Hollis. Thank you, Kathy. Go ahead. Um, I'm just wanted to say clearly that I'm very against this petition. Uh, one of the things there's many reasons, but one in, in Part D, they talk about not wanting censorship, and then in Part E, they elaborate all the ideas they want to censor. This is ridiculous. It hamstrings the educational process, the teachers, the school boards and does a disservice to all of our students' education. And I want to strongly say that I'm against it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Grossman. Um, I'm just trying to see. So I do have Aaron Penkasek again, but um, who's spoken already to this. I have Michelle St. John, who has not. She has not spoken to this. Not to this, okay. no. So we'll take Michelle next because she hasn't spoken to this yet. Right. Michelle. Uh, th yep, thank you. Um, Michelle, thank you for the Michelle St. John, 29 Orchard Drive, Hollis. Um, I am uh, very much against this uh, petition warrant article. Um, I won't go into the details of the content. I think it speaks for itself um, with contradiction and setting its own agenda, again, from a very small vocal group trying to dismantle our um, system as it stands, which has been effective for decades here in Hollis and Brookline. Um, but more importantly, I feel that um, this was a last minute petition with a very specific agenda to bypass the SAU appointed DEI committee who has worked together, 
who has um, listened to each other and the differences had public hearing where they got input from members of the public. It is a process and it sh this should not take precedence over a designated committee where the work to listen to the students and to ensure that um, everyone in our community has the tools that they need to succeed as students. And as the young woman, the young graduate spoke, we do need to acknowledge our past and we need to acknowledge the stories and the history that wasn't told because of the oppression on to the people that they weren't allowed to tell those stories. So uh, I vehemently oppose this and I know that the school board and the voters will do the right thing by this. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, who else do we have? We have Aaron. So Aaron. I have Aaron, I have Anna Birch, I have Drew Morrissey, and then Natalie Hattan. Okay, wait, so you have some, okay, we'll let Aaron go first with the T. Go ahead, Aaron. Okay, I think I'm unmuted at this point. Uh, so, so, so my my points re relative to that, and and actually they're amplified now by what I just heard, is that we should teach history, but we should teach it in an unrevisionist manner. We should teach what really happened. History isn't all good. Some bad history happened, and we should teach that to our students. Right. And, you know, t t Todd made the point earlier, what should we teach? Right. And so we, we need to think about this point. And this is the key, I think, to this whole argument is that if our teachers are teaching the students what to think and not how to think, they have failed as teachers. And that's what this is all about. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, I think we should go to Anna Birch next. Anna Birch. Okay, Tiffany, can I ask you Anna first? Yes, you spoke to this already. Anna, go ahead. Hi, Anna Birch, 16 Broad Street. Um, speaking of teachers, I just wanted to say, you know, I'm, I'm very much against this article. And I have a son in eighth grade, and I can't tell you how deeply impressed I am with the teachers, um, Mr. Caprero, Dr. DeRosa. I just feel like you know, my son has learned so much in these classes. I can't wait for him to go to high school and have um, Mrs. Balfour and so on and so forth. I just feel like they're doing an amazing job and they are getting the kids to really think. I can't believe the conversations my son comes home, you know, talking about what he's thinking about. So, um, and I also want to say I'm really impressed with the DEI committee. I've, I've went, gone to one or two meetings just to listen. And again, broad spectrum, spectrum of people having these conversations. Um, I've been impressed and I just want to say I'm against this article. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Anna. I think you said you have Drew Morrissey. You have Drew Morrissey, yep. Um, shoot, I still have one. Drew hasn't spoken yet, so we're gonna do Drew. And Tiffany's being patient, so. Drew, you can go ahead. Hi, this is Drew Morrissey. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. can okay. Yes, I'm at Eight Hills Farm Lane in Hollis. So I have a couple of things to say. While I support uh, the warrant conceptually, I, I don't support it as written. Um, I'm a parent of two children, uh, Hughes and, and HPS. And um, what I'm really not hearing from anybody is, is the audience that critical race theory should be targeted at, particularly in terms of their age groups. Critical race theory uh, was a series of ideas that originated in college. And these are college level ideas that we do need in some respect to teach our children. But uh, I certainly as a parent wanna have some input as to the appropriate age for some of these things. And the trouble with teaching uh, young kids, for example, in HPS is that when it comes from a teacher, it's, it's, it's not just a suggestion, it's more like uh, authority. So, you know, for the same reason that my child who goes to HPS believes in Santa Claus, because I told him about Santa Claus, he's going to believe anything he's told. Uh, and therefore, um, I really think that, that what we need to be talking about is the appropriate age and the appropriate ideas that we start introducing our kids to these. Thank Thank you. Thank you, Drew. And just a point of clarification, this is the Cooperative School Board, and so we actually oversee grades 7 through 12. <laughs> um, just, just 
clarify. Currently, okay. right and now. just if I could just follow up on that, my older son's going into seventh grade next year. Um, I want to have input as to how these ideas are communicated. I've seen and heard a, very, a lot of reasonable suggestions, and I've heard what I'm going to just refer to as radical suggestions. And I feel as a parent, I need input on that. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, is there one more? Go ahead, Tiffany. You can go up and Gina, then you can tell me. Can you pass the one on one commercial load? A few more points that I want to make is don't be fooled. I do believe that this is against the process and the work that is already there. The reason I believe this is the first slide we saw in this presentation had DEI slash CRT. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is not critical race theory. Critical race theory has never been mentioned in any of the work in DEI, not once, so check them in. Not only that, but critical race theory is not being taught in our schools, nor is it in the curriculum. You can go look at the curriculum. Critical race theory is also not rampant and prevalent in our nation, because I am also an educator in Massachusetts, and it, it's not all over the place. Is it in some pockets? Yes. So is also creation theory, too. I was in Merrimack when we fought that. So the idea of critical race theory and diversity, equity, and inclusion, diversity, equity, and inclusion is not just about race, it's about each individual. In addition, there is a part here, part D, that says any divisive policy that fosters prejudicial discrimination, segregation, intimidation, and censorship will buy the actual statement there. That would be this word article. This is divisive. It's intimidating. It's censorship by listing every single word that can't be said. And talk about words. There were complaints about Oh, this is an undefined term. There are so many undefined terms in this warrant article. And the biggest one of concern would be equity distribution. That's the fear that something will be taken from you and given to someone else. That is not equity in education. Equity in education is giving every student what they need. And it has nothing to do with health, equal outcome. So please, don't be used by this warrant article. We're doing the work. Join us. Thank you, Tiffany. Oh, we have some people. Before you get to Mr. Davis, we have some people here. Um, Natalie Hutan. Okay, Natalie, you repeat. You repeat Todd Porter. Okay, hello. Gregory Darbolin. Can we get you him, please? Hello. Hi. This is Greg. No, I need Gregory. Okay, Gregory, thank you. Okay, uh, I'll speak first. Uh, I'm Greg Darbone at 65 Cleveland Hill Road, Brookline, New Hampshire. And I have had two kids who went through the school system. I'm very proud that they did and great system. I'm talking more as a veteran here than as just a voter. I think Mr. Morrissey and the lady who just spoke, uh, spoke very well about this whole situation. I wanna tell the voters that we are the envy of New Hampshire with our school system. We veterans are invited into the elementary schools, the middle school and the high school to speak to those kids during the various holidays that veterans are associated with. And in fact, a few years ago, the uh, principal of the high school, and I, I don't, it's not Mr. Barnes, but the one before him, maybe, but uh, they wanted to do away with one holiday to increase the academic year. So they decided Veterans Day would be the one that's not, uh, going to be celebrated. The kids put together a petition to make sure that that holiday was celebrated. The kids said, we grew up with these veterans and we want to celebrate them. So I personally do not think we have an issue. I understand this is something that's boiling up throughout our country, but I think here in our school system, we have teachers and parents who understand that yes, we've had bad history, we need to teach it, but we also have great history and we need to celebrate it. So I applaud the parents who wanna be involved, but I also applaud that the school district, the teachers, the principals and the school board all want to celebrate that we are a great nation in very different ways, but we are a great 
nation. So I don't think this is a problem. And I don't think this is a problem that needs a solution for our school district. We should monitor it. Yes. But that's a parent's responsibility and the school board's responsibility. Thank you very much. Thank you, Derek. So um, new speakers that have come before, um, we have Julie Desmaris. Okay, let's have Julie go first, and then we'll go to Mr. Davidson because he's standing, and then we'll go to the other speakers. Okay. Julie? Hi, I'm Julie Damaris, 24 Mill Road in Hollis. Um, just want to say that I'm I'm against this petition. Um, somebody previously commented that teachers shouldn't be teaching our kids uh, what to think, and I agree. Um, I do, however, think that um, they should be taught how we have come to think the way we do, and how historical events and um, decisions that have been made throughout history have influenced um, our the way we look at things socially, um, our worldviews, um, our socioeconomic positions, um, the way this petition is written with the you know, first item being that the you know, center of, of our education, of our kids' education should be coming from the family unit. I think that's intended to uh, take the responsibility out of you know, the this, this school um, setting where everyone should feel um, that they are seen and heard and um, you know, that they've they understand um, that they have a place there and that they you know, understand what discrimination is and how to avoid that and learn from our mistakes. So um, that would be my input. Um, and I just think it's really important that as our kids go out into the world, especially in the later grades, um, that they're, they have an understanding of these you know, historical um, events that have happened that, and, and the reason that, they, that we might all you know, think the way we do. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Maris. Okay, Mr. Davidson. Yeah, Mr. Davidson, you have to speak up, please. People on the Zoom are having a difficult time. Okay, uh, Doug Davidson, 85 Ryan Road, Hollis. Yeah, just to clarify a couple of things that have been said here. Uh, there, there's no way in this petition anywhere, any wording that, that restricts, uh, that restricts uh, communication, talking, and even using the words, okay? All right, it's, the words foster. So we want to foster, um, the prejudicial discrimination and segregation, we, we, want to, we want to foster policies that are against those things, all right? And that's explicitly stated. And uh, further, in the other section, we're talking about fairness and partiality, and we're looking at supporting or not supporting outcomes of equity redesign, equity-based outcomes and redistribution. So related to the term equity, if Ms. Testa thinks that the wording uh, should be changed, then you know, the words mean things. Uh, equity means what it what it means. So why doesn't she not use that term? Why doesn't she have the committee not use that term and talk about equal opportunity? The committees try to redefine the term equity to mean equal opportunity. They don't mean the same thing as several people have commented on. So why don't we use the right word? Why don't we use equal opportunity? Right? Why don't we say we're against discrimination in all forms? Okay. And why, uh, why don't we go about using those sorts of words rather than trying to change the definition of the words as they're written in the dictionary? So I, I don't understand that strategy. I would suggest that she do that, please. If she did that and rejected critical race theory, we probably wouldn't even need a petition, but that hasn't happened. Thank you, Mr. Davidson. Okay, so I feel like we have a couple more people on Zoom, and I think at this point, I'd like if we could probably end this. I mean, we, we have the two people, two or three? Um, we have three people, but we have one new speaker. Okay, so let's just take them in order as they raise their hand. Go no, I'm just checking the order, I'm sorry. Um, Todd Porter. <coughs> Todd Porter. Hello, Todd Porter, 24 Cameron Drive again. So I just wanted to add to what I said earlier that, you know, I think in, in this article, we're, we're not giving enough credit to number one, the administrators. We're not giving enough credit to the teachers in our, in our schools, who everybody has spoke very highly of. And we're not giving enough credit to our students, you know, to, to be able to think critically. I, I understand, you know, seventh, eighth graders, you know, that that is a fear. And as a parent, I was often fearful of what, you know, they would bring home from school or, you know, talking to their friends. But, you know, I think encouraging the discussion, encouraging the open 
conversation about these things is, is not a bad thing. I, I think once we start trying to limit what is discussed in the school, again, is going to detract from the administrators from doing their job, the teachers from successfully doing their jobs, and the students to be given the opportunity to, to think critically and say, is it, do I agree with what's being said or do I question it? Do I challenge it? I, you know, I, I, I really, on the, on the, the whole of this Warren article, I disagree to, you know, with every fiber in my being to say that we need to, as a community, take the decision out of the hands of the professionals, the teachers, the administrators that we have trusted with our children's education for, you know, for a good portion of their lives. And then, you know, try and limit what they can and what they can't say to our students and what they can and can't teach. And, and again, this is all kind of uh, hypothetical. None of these concepts are currently being taught as from what I'm hearing. So this is really just an attempt to leverage a point of view on a, on a group and a community and I disagree with it. Thank you. Thank you for supporting. We have two more speakers and then we're gonna end the public comment portion of this public hearing. Um, we have Colleen Mikovich. Colleen Mikovich. Colleen. Thank you. Yes, I'm here. I'm Colleen Mikovich, 29 Ironworks Road, Brookline, New Hampshire. I'll try to read what I wrote quickly here. I, and I apologize if it's repetitive. I was out of the meeting for part of this. Um, I'm strongly opposed to this position, uh, the petition, petition. It's poorly written, incredibly vague. There is no definition of divisive, yet it asks the community to allow the district to be sued under anti-discrimination and right to know law for anything deemed divisive. It asks the SAU to accept that concepts such as unlearning and critical race theory are by their nature de detrimentally counterproductive to healthy education. Um, this in itself cannot and should not be accepted by a district seeking to teach reality and to teach our children history and civics. This, this petition opens up the district to lawsuits for even putting this forward to the community. It also attempts to create a right to seek damages for words and concepts spoken and discussed while not being clear as to who would be liable for ut uttering those words and then asks a local municipality to wrongly interpret state anti-discrimination law to include concepts the petitioners do not like or do not, do not want their children exposed to. This simply cannot be done and it is not legal on so many fronts. It is essentially asking the district to discriminate by teaching only a preferred anti-inclusive and fake version of history and then asking that the district hold itself and its teachers liable for anyone who chooses to teach history and or social emotional learning concepts in a non-discriminatory, honest and inclusive way. So essentially the petition is asking SAU staff to discriminate, then hold themselves liable for non-discriminatory free speech under anti-discrimination law. And honestly, this petition would be laughable if it wasn't just such a sad reflection of some of the hate. Thank you, Colin. To the last um, speaker that you had recognized before you said we would close is Natalie Hikayan. Okay, Ms. Hikayan. Hi. Hi again. Uh, my name is again Natalie Hikayan, 24 Powers Road, Hollis. Um, and I just, um, you know, a few times it was brought up by some of the speakers, um, some of the things, you know, the ideas that I had mentioned about being a recent graduate. And I just want to say, like, I think there's an unfortunate, this petition raises an unfortunate view, um, a kind of per perspective of critical race theory. And I think it's actually really unfortunate because um, all, if that, you know, and this again, is, it hasn't even really entered the school system yet, but if it were to, it basically means we think critically about race um, in, um, in the community. And which again, is something that would be such a disservice to deprive students of um, in any way, shape or form. Um, you know, and it's simply not discrimination against it. The, the petition doesn't make very clear, but it, it does not, it's simply, it's, this isn't simply not discrimination against students or, or the community to acknowledge, um, the harsh history of race in this country. Um, there's a objective truth to it that is hard to swallow, just like many things in history are. Um, but you, you can't, I mean, you can't, you know, critical race theory applies to it in a way that's honest and um, gives us the opportunity to have honest conversations that 
don't make us feel good, but sometimes that happens. Thank you, Natalie. Okay, at this point, we're going to close public public <coughs> hearing at 9.13 p.m. Um, and we'll be back at 9.14 p.m. Wow, I'm just going to put that. No, so it's still 9.13, John. Sorry. Um, okay, 9.13 p.m. Did you want to, since the public hearing is closed, did you want to shut off the Zoom and have everyone tune into live stream? Yes, that would be great. So since the public hearing is now closed, we will be shutting down the Zoom um, and you can watch the rest of our meeting on live stream. We will, um, which you can access through the SAB website. Um, I'm going to take a two second break, maybe four seconds. I'm actually going to be direct and then we can come back.